Can I welcome you to the Development Committee? I'm Councillor Filmer, I'm Chairman of the Committee. Just a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, I've not been advised that we've got a fire drill planned this morning, so if alarms go off, then they are real. Your exits are to the side and the doors are being in through. Uh, there are toilet facilities located at the back of the room, as with central doors. Uh, if you need to have a drink during the meeting, there's a uh, water on the side and go as well. If I could ask for the members of the public, if you've got a uh, mobile phone with you, please make sure that it's turned off or turned on to silent. Just so that you need to be able to be able to uh, uh, just seeing as we've done from today, today to my right, right uh, officers from our general services and legal team, team we we'll let the plan officers to outline uh, the background and details of the application before us, and on the way into the table, uh, the members will be debating and ultimately deciding the application. Um, just, just uh, in terms, terms of the, the meeting, meeting itself, itself, we're, we're running, running this meeting as a hybrid meeting. Uh, that means that, that in effect, effect, we have a committee meeting in the Canal side here at South North Pedersen. Pedersen. Uh, what, what we, we want, want to do is, though we are joined by various people who are online as well, so they can view what we're doing. Some of our speakers may be joining us by that route. So it's, I would just mention, though, that. The only, the only people that can actively make decisions and make the votes today are those, those members who are sat around the table. Uh, the format of the meeting will be as per the agenda that's been published. Uh, for those of us, for those of you who are joining us online, the local presentations are available via the Council's website. Uh, we'll take each application in turn. Uh, the officers who are outlining the application will then have the public speaking on that item. And I invite the speakers in turn to come forward to speak at the table. Uh, those of you who are registered uh, will have three minutes uh, to outline your comments on the application. And then we will have the debate amongst the members. But once we get through that, we'll go to the debate and then we'll ask for a member to make their proposal. That will be seconded and then there will be a vote. And that vote will be either to support the application against the application or to support the application for a reason. If you also want to believe that you want to stay online by the portfolio of Holden for Development, I think this is all Councillor Slocum on the screen earlier. No, no, if we move, move on to, to the, the agenda itself, the first one we might have is apologies. Do we have any? So I've got to run out of the agenda, but there are no apologies. apologies. That's all right. We're we'll we'll doing a good start, start to get it wrong, number one. one. Okay, okay number, number two is minutes. Remember, we've had the minutes of meeting circulated. Are there any amendments to the minutes? I'm not sure that the proposal is going to be a good all those in favour of that sign to the show. Okay. Pause. Yeah, and, and again, just for the members, uh, you make sure that both your microphone on your laptop and your speaker on your laptop is turned to silent because it will cause feedback to the PA system. Item three is urgent business. Uh, I've not been advised there's any urgent business on our agenda today that isn't covered on our actual agenda. So, public, public speaking time I've outlined earlier, a number of public, those of you who've been registered, um, will we'll take you in turn as, as the applications come forward. You have, have three minutes uh, to, to, to address the committee. You'll see you have a clock on the front. That actually counts the time down so you see how much time you've got left to go. Obviously, if you can try and make sure your comments. Before, before three, three minutes, minutes but I will have two votes once you get to the end of that time. I Item five, five is declaration commitment. Are there, there any declarations that members have this morning? Business. Business. I'll start that with Ken Bryant. Yep. Yes, Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yes, uh, yes, yes, my three, two, two uh, is in my county yeah. division, but I know. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very, very much. much. Yes, Perry. Perry. Yes, yes, thank you. Sorry, I'm a board member. I took no part in the discussion. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Any other members of our last society are doing any? So, Conrad, that's Thank you, Chairman. I'd like to switch on page 92. As a member of a person of interest, as a member of Bridgewater Town, Town Council, but I'll take any part in that discussion. Thank you, Councillor Master. Exactly. Thank, you. Thank you very much. much. Any other declaration? Any, any input? I'd like to just want to make pages on page 52 as well. My candidate did. And again, I'll take any part in that discussion. Um, remember, the public is important. You know, there's a background and members have on applications. Um, where. Uh, a member, has, as you've heard, the declarations today, um, where they've said non predetermination, that basically means what's happened is we have a rule in this committee which says you can either be at the district council level or at the parish and town level. The danger being that you're involved at both. If you've made a decision, been involved in a decision at that early stage, then they may be a deception you come to this in a predetermination of why they are you made the decision. So we so have a rule that you can have involved one the other part of the So what you've heard members say they have been involved, involved that then they can be involved in this meeting, they can make the debate and they can vote to have been involved in the meeting. Which is what you heard from the council members that it's easy to be involved as they are in line up on an application with these express views of the report. And as such, you have to leave and take no part of the occasion's public declaration as a bridge speaker. Item six, six is the issue of the alleged convention, which is one item for note for members. Um, so you had those big bits sent through as part of the report, and I believe that the service is being sent to two members to see, uh, which there are particular. I've had no other reasons you would move forward with this, so if there are particular issues you have, if you can raise those with the officers outside of the meeting, we will have council to the kingdom of the judge. Council to the kingdom, you can give me a mic. And again, and again, just a reminder to all members, please, please don't, don't turn, turn the microphones off. They're on all the time. time. They're controlled from the rear of the room. You can don't press any buttons. Thank you, Jim. There is one more source issue that she makes when that comes to the meeting. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So that's the issue. Okay. Thank you. 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 And uh, that's uh, page, page 30, 30 we're in the parish, parish boardroom. And, and Mr. Titch, I think we'll introduce you to this, please. Thank you, Chairman. 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 Thank
and a handover, handover of, of the village hall and car park to the parish council. Uh, just just some some use some views, photographs and sign. Uh, so so um, this, this is uh, the top, top photograph, photograph is looking back towards, towards the village. The development, the development we've been formed in uh, the sort of top, top uh, uh, part, part of uh, this field, field in the gate here. here. Uh, where, where you can see it's back up on the long road uh, here. The lower, the lower photo, photo again, again uh, uh, the back uh, uh, across the side, you can see it flat, flat uh, 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 piece of farmland at the moment, bounded, bounded by, by uh, a traditional and established uh, head of Top photo, photo again, again, just looking from the adjoining lane, just over some of the George Roads, roads uh, and then. Uh, the, uh, the lower uh, photograph shows uh, taken take from, from sort of the corner, corner of, of the top of the corner of the, of the road, road, just to join the side, side looking back into the village. village. So there's, there's a the bend in the road here, here. Some, some of the properties uh, that are formed of the edge of the village, it's just beyond the city of village school. And then, and then these, these are the photographs of the long brand new name, also where the new vehicle practice is to be formed through the edge of the road here. And then and again, again, looking in the opposite direction, direction that the access was before here. Uh, and the proposal is that the existing edge row would be translocated behind any physical space for, for, for the access. And then, and then finally, to just see these along the road, 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 just as this is looking uh, north uh, up along stone, stone road, these existing properties which are the closest uh, to the application sites, and those are most likely to be immediately affected by the proposal. Uh, so, so that's, that's looking at all the photos that are to be behind, behind the edge of the road located here. Yeah. And, and the bottom photo is in the reverse, reverse direction to the back of the long uh, stage, stage road. road. So, so just, just coming, coming back, back to, to, to the layout plan and uh, the principal development. development. So, so Baldrick, as I mentioned, is a tier four settlement. settlement. So it has its designated as a other plan where policy T4 development and policy T4 allows Either four four houses house are on the edge of Shetland site. site. So, so because, because we're outside, outside the Shetland boundary, the policy allows four, four house, house schemes to be covered outside. outside. Or, or alternatively, the proposals for open infrastructure project. Now, the village hall and car park is the local infrastructure project to be provided here. So, it's not a four house scheme, it's a four house scheme to live in the village hall car park. Now, the village hall car park has been firmly taken priority of the local parish council. The 10 mark dwelling proposed will fund the construction, construction of the village hall car park, which will then be transferred to the parish council, council uh, completed by a section 26 agreement. Currently, the village and the village have much smaller, now quite aged village hall uh, in all the part of, of the settlement. Uh, which, which does, does not have the space, space to be able to cater for the, the range of function uses that can be provided by a much larger more than the, the parish council began to search for a new site going back to 2008 to 2009 after a period of inactivity they will reopen that process again in 2019 undertaking a corporate uh, site locally uh, within the settlement the proposed the application, application site to put forward is that it's close to distance school, that's just a short distance, just up uh, around around site. Site. The school, school has, has no dedicated parking, uh, so people uh, that drop off at different times tend to park on, on the highway. So, so the proposal would, would provide a space to enable parents, parents to park in the new public, uh, in the new park associated, and then walk the short journey to school and drop off on different times. There, there is also a, currently no uh, play area in the village, village so the provision of a local area, area of play, play uh, would address, address the issue. Uh, so, so, as I stated, the 10 market dwellings proposed will be used to cross subsidise the costs of the hall in terms, terms of what that buys, buys includes the construction of the shell, shell of the building, windows and doors, plastering, insulation, wall and floor tiling, drainage, flushing, heating and electrics. A viability of the proposal provided with, with the application indicated the bill costs of the hall would be in excess of £400,000. That combined with other reasonable costs, costs of the hall, which include matters such as the bill costs, fees, professional fees, fees uh, landowners' profit, and, and developers' profit policies, and uh, land costs 
indicate that the scheme is viable, so there are no surplus fund and the other structure elements, for example, housing. The council has reviewed the appraisal, the assumptions within, considered that they are provided on a real basis to indicate the scheme is viable and can fund the cost of the whole hall. Policy to for some other requirements, the proposal uh, in, in terms of its location and in terms of the, it's, it's, it's the character of the scheme, how well related it is to the settlement, uh, and in terms of proximity and other noted officers uh, close, close walking uh, provision to the school. That, that would include provision of a path within the site, so the pavement will be catered. Uh, uh, or we'll be able to walk outside, outside of the, uh, the, uh, the parish estate. Uh, uh, we can do the scheme that's proportionate to the village, uh, being a relatively modest scheme. Um, the, the policy also requires that the local, local job opportunities should be, should be secured, secured and a condition mm -hmm. on the condition would secure a local labour agreement through a local employment. And then and the policy also requires that the environmental tax company will be able to do that. Overall, Overall, therefore, in terms, in terms of the principal elements, the requirements for the people who consider that it is in compliance. Uh, uh, a secondary uh, uh, main consideration is regard to flood risk. Uh, uh, so, so the site is in flood zone, flood zone three, three, as indicated on the map. So the blue areas are the map are the flood zone three. Now, the now policies require national and local for undertaking sequential tests to see if the development can be located in areas, areas of low risk of flood flooding. flooding. So, so if passed, uh, an exception to test applies to ensure that proposals are safe, safe for, for their lifetime, lifetime and do, do not introduce flood, flood risk elsewhere, elsewhere and that there are sustainability benefits. Now, now the science was originally included within the Council's strategic flood, flood risk assessment, dealing with flood zone 3B. A flood, flood zone 3B, the area, the area of functional flood zone. It, it is the area where water is supposed to go, go first at times of flood. Now, the strategic flood, flood risk assessment is a, is a document taken by the Council at a district wide basis. So it is undertaken using uh, lots of LIDAR data, bio data. Um, to take, take a very, very broad approach to designating areas where water is going based, based on, on um, based, based on levels. levels. The, it, it, it does, does not do a detailed assessment on a site by site, site basis. basis. What, what the strategic budget assessment sets out within it is a basis for stating each site, site is not an individual module. Applicants through a flood risk assessment, assessment a detailed flood risk assessment on a site by site basis, have the means to challenge. So to say whether it should, you know, and whether it is been correctly categorised in the strategic flood risk assessment, given the for us, has to be applied to take just a assessment like that. So national policy in relation to that, national policy also states that areas which benefit from flood benefits do not normally be classed as flood zone on the basis, on the basis that, that if, if, if an area, area is defended, defended water, water cannot, cannot go there at the time of flood, flood. Uh, and, and therefore it, uh, water, water is being channeled elsewhere. elsewhere. In, this in this case, this application site is defended, defended. Uh, and the EA maps confirm that. And the Environment Agency has accepted through their consultation comments on this application that the 3D designation is incorrect for this site. Uh, and in their view, it should be categorised as 3A. So based on the fact that there are flood, uh, there are flood defences and that detailed topographical modelling has been undertaken of these specific levels on this site, the EEA are satisfied that 3B is incorrect in this case and that the site, the site instead should be 3A. A sequential test, as I mentioned, then would apply to examine the potential for alternative sites on which to accommodate the development. So potentially the purposes of the sequential test is to see whether there are sites at lower risk of flooding available within the uh, vicinity to accommodate the proposals. Now for sites to pass that test, they must be considered to be reasonably available uh, and they must be able to accommodate the development proposal put forward within the area of search. 
Now, the area of search has to be Baldrip. The, the village hall for Baldrip cannot be provided somewhere else. So the area of search is confined to the village itself. Now, the parish, as I mentioned, undertook that call for sites uh, going back to 2019. And only this site was put forward. So whilst some parts of the village do have areas at low risk of flooding, as you can see from the map there, no other sites are considered to be reasonably available for that test. So th given that this is the only available site, the sequential test has to be considered to be passed in that case. The exceptions test would then also apply. So the applicant did further modelling to satisfy the EA with regard to the exceptions test, and they were required by them to model different flood events and scenarios, including worst case scenarios. Having undertaken that, even with the highest level of assumptions about sea level rises, um, uh, first of all, places of refuge within all the dwellings uh, would be available on all, above all worst case flood level events. The proposal, therefore, would be considered to be safe in flood risk terms for the undefended worst case scenario for its lifetime, bearing in mind that the site does benefit from flood defences. So when we're talking about worst cases, that's an event that the site was undefended, but we know it is defended. On that basis, the Environment Agency in their written responses were satisfied and have removed their initial objection to the proposal, uh, subject to conditions being imposed on the permission regarding finished floor levels, first floor places of refuge and submission of resilience measures. Now, I mentioned the exception test has a sustainability arm as well. Um, so that's about the sustainability, sustainability benefits of a proposal being weighed in, in, in the mix. Now, in this case, the proposal uh, provides a hall, it provides a car park and play areas, and therefore has the opportunity to increase the self-sufficiency of the village and reducing outward trips. And as such, there are sustainability benefits to its provision. So on that basis, we would consider the exceptions test in this case is passed. There's also been involvement from the lead local flood authority as they uh, they are the uh, statutory body for overseeing the management of surface water on sites. They are satisfied that a surface water drainage scheme, that surface water on the site can be appropriately managed um, following further clarifications from, from the applicants. A, um, a, Given that the scheme is outlined, there would be a condition on the permission for the detailed scheme, but in principle, a scheme that essentially attenuates water on site with a regulated discharge to the surrounding ring networks is acceptable to the lead local flood authority. So they are satisfied that that can be conditioned. So overall, on those two grounds of flood risk and drainage, um, the proposal is considered to be acceptable. And then just coming on to other matters. So the I've mentioned about the access uh, in terms of the highway authorities view, view on that. They do not raise an objection. They've considered matters such as traffic generation from the proposal, the size and provision of the visibility displays, and they are satisfied and they are happy that conditions can adequately address the relevant matters. Regarding design and layout, uh, uh, as I stated, it's indicative at the moment, so we don't have designs uh, or the specific layout for the proposal. But there's no reason in our view to consider that a suitable scheme cannot be achieved at reserve matter stage. I believe there's adequate space within the plot uh, to provide uh, the proposals and to provide adequate separation from the existing properties to protect their residential amenity. Uh, the provision of the local area of play uh, is acceptable to the council's open space team uh, and uh, a transfer mechanism will be set out within the section 16 legal agreement. The county ecologists were also consulted and they are satisfied and matters to protect species during construction and uh, landscape and ecological management post construction can be secured by condition. Uh, the site was also initially flagged as being within the phosphates area when the application came in. We've had the application on the books for some time. Um, the phosphates map was revised during the course of the application by Natural England to take out some areas on the east side of Bridgewater, uh, including the area of Baldrip. So Baldrip and the east area of Bridgewater is no longer within the phosphate zone, so that's no longer an issue that affects this application. So just to summarise, uh, the scheme provides a hall and car park, which are local parish council infrastructure priorities. We do not consider that there's any matters which cannot be addressed through conditions or at the subsequent reserve matters stage. So our recommendation, therefore, is that permission should be granted subject to the agreement of the Section 106 agreement and the conditions proposed in the report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, obviously, we have a number of speakers on this. Just before I come to the speakers, 
the issue of drainage has been been raised as obviously a very major issue on this site. Um, a number of members of the planning committee are, are members of drainage boards across the county and it's often on these sort of applications it's worth registering those members who are part of drainage boards. Um, the, the drainage authorities make comments on planning but members of the drainage board don't get involved on that side of it so again it's a, a predetermination thing for members to declare that they are a member of the drainage board but they've taken no part in any discussions on this application so could I ask if any members who are members of drainage board just put the hand up and then we'll make a note uh, for the record as to those so um, that's fine and just to confirm with all those members that you've taken no part in any discussions on this application through the drainage board fine and that's the case for me as well OK, so we will come to the, uh, the uh, speakers. First speaker we have is uh, Sam Walters, please, if you'd like to come forward. Good morning. Just to confirm you're speaking for the application and to remind you, you've got three minutes and you'll see the time on the clock and to start whenever you're going when ready to go. Yes. Good morning, everybody. I am speaking on behalf of the application. Um, my family and I have lived in Bordrip since 2011 and we've seen the community grow stronger and stronger. Um, we get more and more support for events that we put on. Um, I'm pleased to see that these plans are protected by the 106 clause. Uh, the new hall location with the car park would be a great asset to the nearby church and school. Uh, the new development also provides would provide an area for the the play for a children's play area which has been on the cards for a long time but unable to find a space for it uh, the village has outgrown the existing village hall and there are issues with uh, the standard of the hall itself uh, we consider that a new village hall would create a modern focal point and create a stronger community, May, meaning events can be on a larger scale. Uh, we already have community cafes. We had a fantastic Jubilee event over four days, but with, with, with slightly restricted events. Uh, we also we have a community, the community cafe funds, the cri village Christmas tree, um, parties, we do remembrance poppies, Uh, clubs and groups in the village that need need a location consist of the history group, table tennis on a weekly basis, uh, canoeing and kayaking. There's a bit of a classic car group and there's at least three ladies groups, including a dressmaking and sewing group, all which need to be accommodated. Uh, people travel out of the village for fitness, exercise, bridge classes, etc. Um, locally, uh, recently there was Somerset County Council money available for improve, energy improvement grants on uh, community village halls, etc., which we weren't able to claim for as the existing hall was church owned. So any of this sort of thing would help in the future. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mike Merkin, if you'd like to come forward, please. Okay. Welcome to the meeting. You've got three minutes. Start whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. This proposal conflicts with a significant number of planning policies around housing need, sustainability and environmental concerns. I will focus on the three areas of supposed village gain, together with flooding concerns. In 2018, structural engineers reported that the current parish hall is structurally sound and has significant life. A professional village hall advisor in 2019 noted its appropriate size for the village with a minimum of 20 years of life. It's well used at present and has never been stretched to capacity. This year, builders estimated that 20 to 30,000 pounds would refurbish it with new heating, kitchen and accessible toilet. Extensive experience of fundraising gives us confidence in funding this via charitable trusts and grants, 
although this is not possible if competing for funding for equipping a second hall. The applicant is not offering a ready to use village hall, just the framework of a building three times the size of the existing hall, a financial liability. The parish council and the applicant need to enter into a section 106 agreement. However, neither the applicant nor the PC have a business plan to explain how the village can afford such a costly project or how the hall will be managed. Sufficient detail about the local infrastructure priority has not been provided to meet policy T4 requirements. The outline application must fall on that basis. The PC did not indicate a priority for a new hall. It actually indicated that it was a priority for the village to have a hall, that the priority could be met by refurbishment. Parking for the hall will not alleviate current village issues. Problems only exist during school pick up and drop off times. Experiences that parents will continue to park close to the school and a proposed new pavement ends before a dangerous narrow double bend. The third village gain is stated as a play area. This is just a fenced off piece of field. The Environment Agency and the Lead Flood Authority were strongly opposed to development before doing a U-turn. The flooding history of the field is well documented. Despite withdrawing their objection, the EA states that they do not agree with the findings of the applicant's updated flood risk assessment and that a residual flood risk remains. Planning permission should be refused and SSDC can demonstrate that the flood risk is outweighed by the wider sustainability benefits offered and that the development will be safe for its lifetime not increasing flooding risks to properties elsewhere. More residents object this proposal and support it, and the PC do not fully endorse it. It does not offer sufficient village gain to justify 10 houses on agricultural land outside of the village boundary. It offers village pain, not gain. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Councillor Betty, if you'd like to come forward. As you know, Councillor Betty, you've got the three minutes, so start whenever you're ready, please. Chairman and colleagues, I full heartily support this application before you today. Since I have been elected to represent Bordrip on this council, they have been looking at the possibility of a new hall. I am on the understanding that this has been ongoing since 1995. A new hall, car park and open space will enhance Bordrip. Firstly, the car park will alleviate the problems of cars parking along the side of the road at church services and at school times. More often than not, due to the parking, it is impossible for emergency services and fire machinery to get through Bordrep. The current hall does not have an adequate parking for functions, with many visitors having to park along the road when, when attending events. Nextly, the village hall will provide a community building that is big enough to support the local community. At many events, such as parties and funerals, many choose to venture out the village to neighbouring halls to have the function, as the current hall is impractical to hold large gatherings. The open space will be beneficial to Bordrep. The parish council are struggling to find ways to spend the RLT2 monies in the parish, with over £10,000 sitting in the pot with this area, it will give the parish council somewhere to spend this money. Lastly, I would like to draw your attention to the amount of comments received on this application. I believe some of the objections should not be taken into account. These objections have um, come from as far as London. And when looking deeper at the comments, you will see that it is roughly a 50-50 split between those in support and those against the application in Bordrip. There are many others that have contacted me in the area that, have, that are in favour of the application, but they did not want to comment due to conflicting with neighbours. In all, Chairman and colleagues, I would ask that you all use common sense and support this application before you to, this, today for the benefit of Bordrip. Thank you. Thank you very much. come to our final speaker, uh, Robin Upton, would you like to come forward, please? Just to confirm, you're speaking on behalf of the applicant. That's right. Thank Excellent. you, Chair. And again, you'll see the time on the clock start when you're ready, please. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Chair and members, for this opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Robin Upton from Tetratech Planning Consultants, speaking as agent on behalf of the applicant. As the committee report describes, policy T4 allows proposals in locations such as this to cross subsidise affordable housing or local infrastructure priorities. We've heard from various speakers today that the proposed hall is a long standing infrastructure priority for the village, a process that has led to the proposed development and the benefits of the scheme. A purpose built hall at no construction cost to the community is a clear social benefit that weighs heavily in favour of the development and is quite rightly supported by the parish council. Uh, and contrary to the, the, one of the speakers there, the hall would be ready to use um, when it's handed over. We carried out public consultation and took on board comments raised by amending the location of the proposed play area away from existing properties at Stone Drove. A separate access uh, to the proposed homes off Stone Drove was removed so that the development was entirely served by Bradley Lane. Um, there are just over 30 people in the village who have supported the application who recognise these benefits. Whilst uh, more objections have been received, as, as the previous speaker said, a large proportion of these comments are from people that live outside of the village. County highways have specifically welcomed the provision of the new footway across the site frontage to improve pedestrian links from the village to the hall, and no concerns have been expressed uh, in terms of highway safety or uh, access to the village on foot. The car park serves the hall, but also provides parking near the school and the church that will improve traffic uh, congestion at, at drop off and pick up times and services. A lot of technical information has been submitted to address flooding concerns. The site is protected from flood risk defences and the Environment Agency accepts that the site is not functional floodplain. The lead local flood authority and internal drainage board raised no objections. Part of that you saw the flood map on the screen there, the stone drove properties are shown to be in the flood zone. So technically this exercise has effectively taken those existing properties outside of, of the flood plain as well. Um, the county ecologist raises no objection as the site survey shows no detrimental impact to protected wildlife species. It will change the view of the site from the stone drove properties, but as we know, seeing new houses is not a relevant planning consideration. In fact, properties either side of a road would be a normal everyday occurrence. The submitted layout demonstrates that the proposed number of homes and the hall can be provided on the site without due harm to the amenity of neighbouring properties and sufficient buffers can be provided. In short, there are no technical reasons to prevent the development coming forward. Chair and members of the committee, uh, the report before you is recommended for approval and we hope that you will support it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I come to members, I'm just going to come back to, to Mr. Titchener. Issues have been raised, obviously, particularly relating to uh, the flood zone, the flood risk issues, and I'll go ask for some further clarification on that. Uh, and also, if I could ask if um, the issue has been raised about, obviously, the reason why this is justifiable outside the boundary, if you could just clarify why that is and, and what the backing is that makes that the case. Thank you. So in terms of being outside the village boundary, that's, um, I mean, as I touched on in the presentation, it's um, Bordrip is a designated settlement within our hierarchy. So we have a range of settlements that are, that are designated for a, a certain amount of development. And uh, that starts with Bridgewater and goes down to uh, larger settlements, down to villages, tiers one to four, so tier four being the smaller of those. And then there are policy provisions that talk about what development can take place within the settlement boundary of those villages, but also provisions that allow um, sites that are well related. So we would see that as being either physically adjoining or in very close proximity to come forward. Um, and for, for very specific reasons, now those very specific reasons are to provide affordable housing schemes or other local infrastructure projects. And that's, as we've heard today, the local infrastructure project here is is, is the village hall. That's something that's been put forward by the parish council over 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 quite a, a long time, and it's been quite a long, uh, not just their call for sites process, which they started in 20, 2019, but historically, as we've heard, that they've been working on for, for for a number of times. So, in terms of policy compliance and the tests in that policy, in the tests they have to go through. There is a basis for releasing agricultural land on the edge of a settlement for a proposal such as this, where it has that parish council backing and where it is for an infrastructure priority project. Um, I just want to quickly touch on another point, if I may, that was raised by one of the speakers about the Environment Agency not accepting the findings of the applicant's flood risk assessment. Um, the, uh, the applicant's flood risk assessment obviously went through that 
within it set out that process for challenging some of the some of the the flood zone freebie designation and through that discussion with the environment agency there was a discussion about what was the appropriate flood zone, for, flood zone designation for the site and I think there was some pushback from the environment agency to say it wasn't a lower flood level flood level than 3a at one point there was a discussion about whether it was perhaps flood zone 2 um, uh, that was the what the environment didn't accept was that they accepted it was 3a and therefore because it's 3a we had to go through those tests of the sequential tests and the exceptions test. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Councillor Kingham, you indicated. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, it sounds a, a very nice scheme for for videos such as Ball Trip. But there are a number of concerns that, that I have. One one is the the mix of I know appreciate it's only a, an outline application, but the mix of dwellings for a village. Notice that. Um, there's a pair of semi houses and block of three, and the rest of them are, are detached houses. I feel that if it was for a village, there should be more small units for families, as we're creating a, a village where be more village friendly for families, and obviously with a school close by. So maybe smaller properties would be better than the five detached houses. Um, the village hall. I know that you've got a a 106 agreement. But to build a village hall of this complete uh, to hand over before development, 10 houses doesn't seem to be sufficient to develop that hall. Um, I've had this in the past where a developer on a larger site was going to build a village hall for the village. And at the end of the day, they had to cut the cost because then they couldn't build that hall for what uh, they originally proposed. So I don't know how a village hall can be built with the backing of 10 houses on a site like this. Um, obviously, the flooding issues is, has been um, sorted and has been agreed, but the village hall complete with 10 houses is a problem to me. Thank you, Mr. Titchener. Just to pick up on the about the property sizes, so obviously the application is just in outline at the moment. So the plans that are shown and the individual size of those properties are, it, it is not something that's fixed at the moment. That's just an indicative plan to show that you could accommodate ten dwellings broadly in the space of of, of that of that application. Uh, would, would wouldn't fall under the, the um, master plan idea under your interpretation I'm looking at that policy and thinking it probably yeah, yeah what I'm seeing isn't a detailed master plan um, um, anyway we'll move on to um, I've had a concern about the play area um, I notice um, we under policy d34 there should be a leap within 400 meters of a housing development over uh, eight house eight houses I've um, got a, a lap in this case are we able to secure? I think um, Mr. Uh, Councillor Betty mentioned that there was RLT2 funding available. Are we able to secure that that funding would go towards equipment for the lab to make it a leap? This is Doreen. Thank you. Um, just going back to the first point originally in terms of the um, requirement for the, um, what was it, master plan, we we do have quite a few within the local plan exception policies that release sites on the edge of settlement boundaries subject to meeting something in particular. Within the guidance ahead of the policy document, it does encourage them always to be full applications because it's much better if we have all the detail up front. But it also does accept that we can have them in outline. We have had them in outline. We have refused them in outline, not for that reason, um, but then they've been allowed at appeal. So. As it's guidance ahead of the policy, there's not a policy requirement for it to have a master plan. Um, but the thrust in terms of um, what Dean was touching on earlier, because there's an indicative layout from a master plan, you'd expect to see the commercial area, the play space, the car park area, the residential area. That's all shown on the indicative information we've got. So on that basis, we're happy we've got enough to determine it. And it is guidance ahead of the policy rather than actual policy requiring a master plan. So you know, the preference always for us would be to have a full detailed consent up front because it's a lot easier for everyone, um, but it is permissible for it to be outlined subject to details. Um, in terms of lap and leap, um, they are also proposed to be secured through the 106. 
as part of the 106, the equipment that goes into them gets agreed with the Parks and Gardens officer. So if the LAP needs to have a few more bits of equipment to satisfy policy requirements, that will come in through the 106. If in the provision that there's just a LAP being delivered and the Parish Council have funds to deliver infrastructure, they have that through the community infrastructure levy. So that can go in independently outside of the planning process. But we would be assessing the equipment that comes in in terms of make, making sure we're happy that the 106 sets out what's being required for that open area of space. My understanding was that the, the 106 was only securing a lap and not a leap. And I'm looking to see whether we can secure a leap through through the condition or through the 106. I think it's probably a point we have to discuss further. In terms of the obligation requirements on the developer, it's a lap, but the parish council is also party to the agreement. So if the parish council felt they wanted to increase the funds to go into it to provide the leap, if that's what their wish is, they, they can do that through the 106 process. It's not something that we're requiring at the moment because the financial viability that we've had from it sets out what the infrastructure costs of the development are what the cost of the development is and then confirms that there's no money left at the end of it. So in terms of what's being provided at the moment has been justified on a um, viability appraisal. So you're suggesting to me that the parish council can secure this, but that we can't on this development committee. Is that my understanding? The parish council are party to the agreement and they have RLT2 funds that they can't spend anywhere else. So it makes sense if they wanted to align it, they can but it's not something that we're currently proposing but could we propose it sorry a second. question but could could we make that could, proposal that it should be a leap rather than a lap don't think we can under policy yeah Mr. yeah i mean i i think the policy requirement is is for a lap so I think as far as the planning application, all we can do is require a lap, which would then be secured by the 106. Uh, if there are Mr. RMT... Howard, can I just butt in for a minute? Could you just, for, for members of the public, just clarify what the difference between what a leap and a lap is? Because okay. we keep talking about leaps and laps, and I'm fair yeah. so it's people wondering <laughs> what on earth we're talking about. You didn't ask anyone else, I'm yet. sorry. No, I, I've got to try and remember. <laughs> uh, locally equipped area for play is a leap, and uh, local area for play is a lap. So a leap is larger than a lap, generally has more equipment to it. That's the easy bit, I think, of the answer. Uh, uh, so in terms of the application, it requires a lap, which is what, uh, the, what the consul T, the, um, uh, the recreational officer, has said is required. What you're asking, I think, Councillor the Revelands, is if this was allowed, could we, could we add a condition or put something in the 106 to say RLT2 money should be paid to increase it to a leap? I think the answer to that is no, we couldn't because on, on the planning policy basis, we couldn't. Could we informally have those discussions with the recreational officer to allow the discussion between the parish whilst they're negotiating, whilst they're negotiating on the 106? Yes, I think we could. You do that, please. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, um, do, could, do, I'll, I'll, just a, a separate point to echo uh, Councillor Kingham's concern about viability on this. I do appreciate that's been answered as well, but that would be a major concern for me here. Understood. Yeah. Yeah. This is Lehman. Um, sorry, Stuart, I'm going to ask, to ask for clarification. Um, if the resolution says that it's a lap to go into the section 106, I cannot go beyond the resolution, so it will be a lap in the section 106. I, I think that's what I suggested in terms of how we would deal with it. The minute we'll know Councillor Revers' question mm. and request, and I use the word informally, so I think we would be able to say to the uh, recreational officer at the time, is there an opportunity to use, it could be outside of the 106, it could be outside of the planning system, because I don't think Councillor Revers worries about how it could be delivered. I think it's a case of, is there the opportunity to spend RLT2 monies to increase the equipment that's identified as part of the LEAP? And, and I'm saying informally we can do that, but as part of this planning application, it, we would say, no, heads of terms on the 106, I get your point, it will be for a lap. It doesn't mean there can't be an informal arrangement if it's possible and if everyone wants that, you know, because we're just assuming that everyone wants that. for that to happen. It would make sense, wouldn't it? And to use Councillor Betty's terms, common sense to, to 
bit more bang for your buck. Okay, so just for clarification purposes, Councillor Rebens, it will be outside of the Section 106 agreement, so it will be outside and an informal arrangement outside of the planning system. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do understand uh, what Mr Hewlett has said, and um, I do assure him that it's not the detail of how it's delivered. It's the it's 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 whether it can be delivered that that, that that keeps me awake at night. OK, thank you. I've got two speakers indicating at the moment, Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Pearce. So Councillor Hendry. Good morning, Chair and Councillors. Thank you. Um, I'd like to thank, first of all, the first speaker for his uh, local knowledge and heartfelt comments. That's hmm. OK. I first of all agree with Councillor Bill Revens about the uh, equipped play area. I didn't even give that consideration. I actually until he picked it up and I absolutely agree with him. And I don't think there'd be a big problem if he spoke to the developer if they would actually come to an agreement and do something about that. But yeah, he's absolutely right. The statutory consultees with this are actually all on board if you look down through them. When highways are on board, that's a big starting point for me because that's the way it is with the roads, etc. The crime prevention officer, no comments, not, not, nothing to county education. They have sufficient capacity in the school with there's children there, which I'm sure there would be. You, you have to allow you have to allow something like this to be developed and go forward because we don't do it today. It'll probably be done in 15 years time anyway. So what, what's the difference? It, it will come as time goes on, I'm sure. I don't have much doubt about that. I can't see anything within the the county rights away, economic development, county education, crime prevention. I can't see anything here to concern me at all. Everything looks above board and as it goes. The developer willing to do a village hall and a play area, as mentioned by uh, Bill Revens there, could be amended, uh, and a car park also. I have no problem with this whatsoever, nothing. I, on the basis of everything I've just said and agreements with uh, Councillor Revens, I would like to bring forward the case of recommendation to grant permission. Thank you. So just to confirm you're proposing that. OK, Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I've got no problem with the, the layout or the, the design of the development, and I can appreciate that potentially it can deliver a facility that it seems that half the village um, are wanting and, and see as necessary. I do have some concerns, though. Um, is there protection within this um, application that prevents there have been concerns raised about the viability of the business planning of the of the village hall and what is there to prevent what should be a, a benefit in a fully functioning village hall what is there to prevent it being partially built or built and then with respect to the parish council because i don't know anything about uh how, how it operates if it ends up being a white elephant um what is there to prevent that happening as a result of this application and the other thing is um yesterday in this room we declared an ecological emergency and so i do have concerns about it being built on a green field and the fact that hedgerow will need to be taken up or be re-established uh, replanted so, and I noticed with condition 16 states that the landscape ecological management plan will, is a requirement of this. Is there any more detail you can give me about that plan that will mitigate against all the negatives in terms of ecology um, so that there is no um, net loss to biodiversity as a result of this? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Titchener or Mr. Debris, whoever wants to go first. I just, I just, if I just pick on the latter point first about the landscape and ecological management and the use of agricultural land. I mean, in terms of the loss of agricultural land, I absolutely take that point. Uh, what we have to bear in mind is the limited, the call for sites that was put forward, yeah, put only one site forward. You know, no brownfield sites, for example, were put forward. There are going to be limited options in a rural village about where a facility that's going to have this kind of land take is going to go. So I take that point, but the options are obviously particularly limited, you know, and it's at the only site. In terms of the landscape and ecological, ecological management plan, now that's a, a detailed document that will need to be written and submitted and approved by the county ecologist. So what we obviously don't have it at the moment. What we would expect within that is measures to maintain and uh, enhance things like existing hedgerows on the site and boundaries so that they are protected 
you know, so that it's accepted there'll be some short term impacts during construction because that has to happen. But it's about managing those in the long term. So, you know, maintaining them at a suitable height. May, you know, if there if there's gaps in any hedgerows that they are gapped, you know, gap back up with native species, for example. So that's about maintaining the as, as much as possible, the ecological status quo. Um, and then there's also other conditions about delivering biodiversity enhancement. So there's a separate condition where the applicant will have to give details of uh, biodiversity enhancements. Now, we don't have the information on that at the moment because it's a condition, but we would expect that to include things like bird boxes, bat boxes, for, for, for example. Um, there may be other measures. Sometimes they put in things like hedgehog friendly fencing, this kind of thing, um, you know. Uh, uh, so there's various measures to ensure the um, management of the site overall, notwithstanding that some of that detail has to come through via the condition stage. We don't have it at the moment. I don't know if you want to make a point. Yeah, management. The first point, I think, was um, about making sure that the hall's actually deliverable, that it actually happens. Um, I think that will be secured in terms of what triggers are put on it in terms of the 106. So in the 106, we can require its delivery we can um, stall occupations of sort of some of the 10 units. I don't know whether you'd go, we'd have to have a debate in-house in terms of what a reasonable trigger would be, um, but effectively it would limit what development could come forward until the hall is delivered. But that trigger would have to be subject to legal um, debate and advice in terms of what's reasonable, because we can't um, be unreasonable in terms of legal agreement. Um, subject to that all being secured, in the event they don't deliver it, they'd be breaching the 106 and then it comes down to enforceability. If they are looking subsequently because viability has, has crashed to not deliver it at all, it's a different scheme. So they'd have to come back in through planning um, and then they wouldn't have the justification if they're not delivering um, the local infrastructure requirement. So in the event it's not delivered at all, it would have to be a fresh application, which I would suggest wouldn't have the same policy support as the current proposal. And there should be triggers within the 106 requiring its delivery at a set point in the development programme. But exactly what those triggers are, we haven't determined yet because we're still early stages of the 106. But that would secure um, delivery of the asset ahead of full occupation of the 10 units. If I could just ask you to hold one moment, Councillor Pierce. Mrs. Lee. Councillor Pierce um, and um, Mrs. DeVries. Um, to allay um, members' fears of the um, the um, village hall being ready for use, we can tweak the wording in the recommendation to say that the developer fully constructs ready for use and transfers the village hall if that would be more acceptable. Yes, I think that would be. Um, I think it's, it's that assurance that we're not left with a partially developed site that doesn't deliver what we, mm. what the expectations are. What's the wording? Yeah, yeah, I'm looking at the agenda and reading them. Fully construct and transfers the proposed village hall. So I'm suggesting fully construct and ready for use. Oh, right, and right. Um, transfers yeah. the village hall. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Have I got any other members wanting to comment? Councillor Pierce? Come back on the, the ecological front. Um, you said about um, sort of reinstating the status quo and you would expect to see certain things within the lamp, but is it possible to put extra protections about um, net, um, okay. about net zero loss, if, if <laughs> that sort of um, is making sense, so that there is no net loss in terms of um, planting and because because there will be runoff i know the floods the flood concerns have been sort of uh, um relief to a to a certain extent but of course there will be the flood the water runoff from the site itself which will be then uh, addressed by asserts but it's just trying to because we are losing a field because we've declared an ecological emergency it's just trying to protect the environment as much as we can as a result of this development Ms. Therese. Thank you. Um, in, in terms of what details would expect, so as part of the LEMP, you'd expect to understand what the ecological value of the current site is, which is what Dean was referring to earlier in terms of maintaining the status quo. As part of the current ecological value of the site, 
um, agricultural fields that are used agriculturally actually have fairly limited value apart from the hedgerows and things around the edge. So the habitat that you get on arable fields is mainly sort of the wooded and hedged areas around the back. So the bit that would impact would be any hedgerow coming out. Any hedgerow coming out would need to be mitigated by more hedgerow going in. And we would be looking for biodiversity enhancements, which would be a plus onto what the exact um, the existing is. But the detail of that would be in a plan that shows us exactly what's going where, which would be part of the next application. So normally, because this is an outline application, you will get an approval of reserve matters. They've got the option. They can either submit it separately as a discharge condition on the outline or they can provide the detail as part of the approval of reserve matters application. And if we sign it off, that discharges that condition. But we will get that information come through when we've got the detailed layout, because that's where we know what mitigation is going where. OK, Councillor Hendry, can I just confirm you're happy with the amended wording that was suggested in terms of OK? Uh, I'll come to I've got Councillor Grimes first and I've got Councillor Facey, so Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to hear that the parish council are willing to take over the village hall and hopefully they've considered the implications that can become an issue in, in time to come. Um, as this application has been accepted as 3A by the Environment Agency, I'm happy to second the recommendation in this case with the conditions listed and the wording that's been put forward. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Councillor Facey. I'm glad you're going, Chairman. Can you hang? Say again. Sorry. Uh, Councillor Grimes has stolen my thunder, okay. Chairman. I do apologise for not blowing. <laughs> no problem. Okay, members, we have then a recommendation, which is to to grant permission with the updated wording as outlined. Uh, that's been proposed and seconded. Those in favour of that, please show. Two, three. Two, three. And those against, please show. And any abstentions? That's clearly carried, so permission is granted uh, 11 votes in support, no against, and one abstention. Yeah, if uh, Councillor Facey, could you possibly let Councillor Betty know he can come back in? Yes. Can I ask you all to take your seats again then, please? OK, and if you can turn to page 52 on your agendas, we're moving to the parish of Limpsham. And Mrs DeVries, I think you're introducing this one for us, please. Thank you very much. Um, so the application before members is land at Beavers Lodge Farm, Limpsham Road in Limpsham. Um, it's proposed 40 um, dwellings as a rural exception site. So 16 of the 40 dwellings are proposed to be affordable housing. And it includes a public footway across the um, front of the site and formation of a new vehicular access. So the main considerations for the development is principle of development, site skill and design, looking at um, character of the surrounding area, impact on any heritage assets, impact on adjoining properties, highway considerations, impact on ecology, flood risk and drainage. So this just shows the application site outlined in red. Um, I will just point out the red outline for the site has actually extended, so it does um, extend across the front here to connect onto a pavement. So the red outline um, extends across the whole of the front and connects to a pavement sort of slightly further up. So the site is located in the countryside and it does adjoin the settlement boundary to the west. There are two residential properties on the opposite side of the road. So these properties here, um, that's Coppice End Cottage and Coppice Cottage, um, and two properties to the east, which is Crossways Farm and Fairfields and a small cul-de-sac to the west, so this is a small cul-de-sac here, um, which backs onto the site, which is called Worthy Crescent. Um, there are also land drains along the boundary of the site and to the front and rear of the land parcels, um, which are generally surrounded by hedged boundaries. So aerial photograph of the same area. So it's, it's this area, just if you follow the curse around. So effectively, there's a field to the front here um, the access into the site currently at the far edge going to um, the main farm and then area of land to the back here. So it's just an aerial photograph of the site. Um, first land parcel is arable at the top end of the parcel and to the rear is currently used. This is storage of vehicles. 
Um, the rectangular land to the east, which is this area of land along here, um, that's also proposed as additional bio, um, enhanced biodiversity enhancements, which I'll come on to later. So in terms of location, the development joins the settlement boundary to the west. Policy T3A is relevant in this case, and it supports the release of sites well related to the settlement boundary, um, subject to the proposal delivering 40% affordable housing, which should meet an identified housing need. So the affordable housing manager for this um, scheme has confirmed that the 2019 housing needs assessment following delivery of Bex Farm in West Road still has a remaining need for 16 affordable dwellings. The original application of this um, site was for 50 dwellings, um, which would have resulted in 20 affordable um, homes, um, which was over the identified requirement for the affordable housing. So to ensure compliance with the housing needs assessment and address other concerns that were raised with the developer in respect to scale of the development, the um, overall layout was reduced to 40 dwellings. Um, the layout is, um, is proposed to provide 13 social rented dwellings um, and they range from one to four bed properties and three shared ownership, which meet the needs that's identified in the housing needs assessment. So I'll cover layout scale and design later in the presentation but officers are satisfied that the development would provide for an identified um, housing need in accordance with the housing needs assessment, and the site is well related to the settlement boundary. So in respect of local job opportunities, a local labour agreement is conditioned to create opportunities throughout the construction of the process, and in respect of infrastructure opportunities, the application site is proposing a pavement along the site frontage, which would provide safe pedestrian connectivity to the wider area. So in principle, there's no objection to the development under policy T3A. So in terms of layout, um, the next slide just breaks the site into half. Um, so the sh this um, shows the front end of the site um, and the original proposal. So this was for the 50 units. Um, the Limpsham Road frontage was fairly dense when viewed in respect to the character of the surrounding area. Um, and with the area to the west of the access appearing sort of almost terrace. So that's this selection of properties across here. Um, the detached units on the front were also quite closely spaced, um, as were the properties when you move into the site. Um, and just to keep navigation of the site, this is the public open space, which is located relatively centrally. So it will keep you orientated as we go to the next slide. So again, this is the public open space here. Um, the layout again to the rear left little opportunity for spacing and there were some concerns in terms of clustering and density of the affordable housing towards the rear of the site. So the amended plans um, reduce the overall density of the development from 50 to 40, um, which allows for a much more spacious road frontage. So you've got detached unit, detached unit, detached unit. So you've got more relief in between the units. They also removed one of the detached units from this um, street scene, so it gives it an overall more spacious feel um, and the footpath was extended um, so over in this direction and again over in this direction um, to just make those connections. The layout to the rear of the Limpsham Road frontage um, was also sort of uh, reorganised to be more spacious. And again uh, to the bottom of the site there is more relief in the siting and spacing of the properties and some of the affordable units are smaller in footprint than the open market housing but this is because they are designed to meet an identified housing need, so that they have to be smaller units to meet the housing needs assessment. Um, and that includes one bed dwellings, uh, which have been arranged into one larger building, which on face value appears comparable in appearance to the surrounding development. So just to provide some context in terms of the application, um, it was supported with a landscape and visual impact appraisal, uh, which separated the land into three zones. So the land parcel to the front is shown as area A um, and splitting the character of the land parcel to the rear into B and C. Um, a is the section adjoining and visible from Limpsham Road. Area B is being utilised currently for the storage of vehicles um, and area C remains currently as meadow. So the top photo, the top image, um, that shows a view of area A from the existing access. Um, and the second photo shows a view um, from the west of Limpsham Road. Um, and the bottom image shows a view within the site looking back towards the highway. So this one's within the site looking back towards the highway. This is the current access 
um, to the field. And this is the pair of properties on the opposite side of the road. Again, this is the pair of properties on the opposite side of the road. It's a view across the front from the highway. So these images show photos of area B, um, which is the area currently being utilised for storage. The one at the top is taken from the access point into this land parcel um, from the internal access road. And the second photo is taken from within the site, looking back towards the vehicles that are being stored. Um, the property in this image is Beaver's Lodge Farmhouse. Um, so this is Beaver's Lodge Farmhouse here. Um, and the bottom photo is just further land within this parcel, just looking north um, towards it. So that's another view of Beaver's Lodge Farmhouse there. And this is the edge of the um, properties in the cul-de-sac. And uh, these are wide ranging views. So these are from the bottom of the land parcel. So the area that's been identified as area C um, and they're taken from the middle and the end of both corners of the site. So this is from the middle of the site. Again, Beaver's farmhouse um, properties within the cul-de-sac and then right down the far end. So again, Beaver's Lodge farmhouse there, stored vehicles along here um, and the cul-de-sac arrangement there and a view from the far corner looking sort of diagonally back towards uh, where the access would be. So within the site, um, there's a range of one to five bed properties with a mixture of detached, some semi-detached and some terrace properties and a small block of one bed apartments set behind the main frontages. There's differing designs and detailing um, with properties with gables, hips, bay windows and porches. Um, and many of the properties have seal and lintel details, and some of them have coins. The decorative gable properties are positioned near the front of the site to reflect the properties opposite. And the block of one bed apartments shown, shown centrally on this slide would appear appropriate given the layout, given the windows and porches. Um, and many of the properties have seal and lintel details, and some of them have coins. The decorative gable properties are positioned near the front of the site to reflect the properties opposite and the block of one bed apartments shown, shown centrally on this slide would appear appropriate given the layout, given the larger properties. There has, um, subsequent to creating this presentation, been an amendment to this property type. So this door has been centralised and there's been a first floor window added in here just to um, add a bit more interest into the frontage and make it more comparable to the market housing. So in terms of street scenes, the top image shows a view from Limpsham Road and the middle and bottom show a view either side of the main road. So I'll point out um, that the below street scene has been shrunk to fit on the slide. So these these aren't all mini properties. So I just have to <laughs> shrink it to, to fit it all on the same slide. So apologies. Um, but if you can visualise that being the same proportions as these, um, it just shows that there is quite a variety in terms of street scenes. Um, in respect of overall layout, uh, the Crime and Design Officer is satisfied that the public open spaces are well located and the orientations of the dwellings provide good surveillance and there's clear distinction between public and private spaces. So this one gives you the coloured version so you can see sort of the footpath along the front, the connection through and the amount of landscaping to the buffers around the edges. Um, there's two areas of play space on the site, uh, one to the front and one centrally located. The size, location and equipment for these spaces have all been agreed by the Parks and Gardens Officer and will be secured through the Section 106. So in respect of planting, um, what I've done, I've, I've put the coloured layout alongside the landscape plan because the landscape plan looks quite technical and doesn't really give you a good um, oversight, but it is detailed in terms of what landscaping is going in, the particular species, the layout, the density. So all of the detail of the landscaping is on the landscape plans. Um, there was concern raised uh, regarding potential impacts um, by third parties. So the hedgerow at the front would have to be removed to allow for the access, um, highway improvements and the pedestrian access. Um, but it's proposed to be reinstated with additional landscaping around the site. Um, it's shown as a hatch line on the above plan. So this hatch line along here, which again is shown sort of as a hatch line across this area as well. Um, around the hedge is a flowering lawn mix um, and the orange bands on the one 
um, would be meadow grass planting and the existing hedges along the boundaries um, are proposed to be retained and the hedge to the centre of the site, so this hedge row along here, um, is also proposed to be uh, retained and reinstated. So circles on this plan, if members can see it, are trees. It's sort of more clearly indicated, I think, on the colour. Yeah. The bottom half of the site, so again, public open area of space in this location, um, it continues to the rear of the site with additional planting to the frontage of the properties um, and details of the landscaping have all been submitted and agreed in writing with the landscape officer. So as such, officers are satisfied in respect of size, scale and design, subject to the conditions that are recommended on the back of the report and subject to a section 106. So in respect of um, heritage, Southwest Heritage Trust have confirmed that the proposal would have limited or no archaeological impact and therefore no, no objection in terms of archaeology. The properties um, on the opposite side of the road are traditional in design, but they're not listed. Um, during the application, uh, the access to the site was moved to the east as it was originally immediately opposite these houses. So there were some concerns about lights from vehicles spilling into windows as they enter and leave the site. Um, plot one is the nearest um, property proposed to this development. So that's down here in this bottom hand corner. Um, at the closest point, it's 11.5 metres. Um, obviously, there's a separation of a footpath, some landscaping, the highway, and then the property setback itself or the neighbour's setback itself. Um, due to the relocation of the access and then the subsequent setback and orientation of the development from the highway, there's not considered to be any adverse impact on the amenities of these dwellings. So this shows um, Beavers Farm and some of the properties within Worthy Crescent that back onto the site. Um, the properties have a landscape boundary and there's a landscape buffer before the end of the rear gardens of the development. Um, the, uh, the buildings closest to the boundary are single storey. Um, so in terms of this layout, so these are single storey garages. So this is the um, boundary to the site, this is the landscape um, buffer edge, and then this is the edge of the boundary to these properties. Those elements and that element are single storey, so it's two storey at this point. So Crossways Farm uh, presents hip gable to the access, um, which has no windows and again would be a good distance from the post development. Um, so again, another view, so that's the side elevation of this property here taken from the access road looking back towards it. Again, there's a good degree of separation between that and the nearest residential dwelling. So the recommendation on the application includes noise conditions um, and a construction management plan in the interest of the amenities of the surrounding residents. So a lot of concern has been raised in respect of highway safety. So given the existing highway and lack of a safe um, pedestrian route, the development would result in an increase in traffic on this road, but would also provide a pedestrian route within the site, which would connect to the pavement to the east. County highways have reviewed the details within the transport statement and consider the additional traffic generation from this site can be accommodated without detrimentally impacting on highway safety. The parking provision is considered to be acceptable in accordance with standards and the access and visibility display are considered to be acceptable and the impacts of construction um, are considered to be adequately controlled through a construction management plan. So the proposal would result in a highway safety enhancement given the um, provision of a pavement which doesn't currently exist um, and the route would be controlled by condition and through 106. So in terms of ecology, um, it's the landscape plan again, apologies. Um, in addition to the on-site planting, uh, the landscaping proposed um, an area of ecological enhancement in the proposed eastern field. So all this plan sets out sort of the different uh, species and planting areas within the application, self, uh, application site itself. And then the area of um, rectangular land that goes off to this area um, was specified in this plan. So this details um, 45 metres of hedgerow. Um, 2,775 square metres of flower rich meadow, um, which again is proposed to be secured by 106. Um, there are also a number of conditions recommended requiring a landscape ecological mis um, mitigation plan and a construction environmental management plan, which is different to the construction management plan. It looks specifically at ecology and ecology mitigation. Um, 
and Natural England supported the advice of the ecologist and therefore the conditions have been imposed. So there's no objection from Ecology or Natural England and they are recommending conditions to secure the betterment. In terms of um, drainage and flood risk, a drainage strategy has been provided for the site and detailed calculations have been consulted on uh, with the LFA and the Environment Agency. Um, they were satisfied with the proposal and the additional information with the additional information that's been provided. Um, the site is located within flood zone three, although it does pass the sequential test as it needs to be well related to, to the village to meet the identified housing need for this area. Um, if you look at um, any other edge of settlement locations, they are also within flood zone three. So there isn't an alternative edge of settlement site that's at lower flood risk, um, notwithstanding whether it was available or not. So in terms of flood risk, it's passed the sequential test. Um, the Environment Agency is satisfied with the proposal, subject to minimum finished floor levels, um, which have been confirmed with the developer and are subject to condition on the back end of the report. Drainage rates um, have also been confirmed with the IDB and buffer strips have been enabled to um, provide to provide a um, buffer to the land drains. Details of the surface water has been conditioned in respect of ensuring there's no surface water runoff on the highway um, and officers are therefore satisfied the application would be acceptable in respect to flood risk and drainage. So in conclusion, the principle of development is considered to be acceptable in accordance with policy T3A. The size, design and scale relative to the character of the surrounding area is considered to be acceptable. Um, there's no um, impact, adverse impact on heritage assets in terms of ecology or sort of conservation areas or listed buildings. Um, the impact on adjoining properties is not considered to give rise to any degree of harm that would um, support refusing the application. And highway considerations, county highways support the application subject to conditions and securing the betterment as part of the development. And similarly, impact on ecology, Natural England and the county ecologists have supported the application subject to conditions, which again are being imposed and a 106 is being imposed in terms of the mitigation land that's proposed. And flood risk and drainage, um, all statutory consultees are satisfied with the development. So again, conditions are being imposed. So the application is being recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, you see we have a number of speakers on this one. If we could start with James Cole, please. I'd like to come forward. Good morning again. You'll see the time on the clock. Start when you're ready, please. Thank you. I live at Coppice Cottage, which is opposite the northern edge of the proposed site. I've emailed the committee a number of documents which I shall refer to during my uh, three minutes. A similar exception development for 20 dwellings, which eight are classed as affordable, is near completion in the village. If the Beavers Lodge scheme is approved, 60 houses all outside the village development boundary will be built. This is excessive, unsustainable for a tier three settlement of just 235 dwellings. That's ONS 2011 census numbers. A 25% increase in the number of dwellings will generate demand for local services and employment on a scale which cannot be met. This does not comply with the local plan policy T3A. I quote, the scale of development should be appropriate to the size, accessibility, character and physical identity of the settlement. Nor does it comply with the national planning policy framework, which states that rural exception sites are small. 40 dwellings is not a small development. Even Strongvox's own landscape and visual appraisal concede in point 9.7. Point the development will have an impact on the views from Lynchville Road as you approach the village. The magnitude of changing character of the view will be major. Point two, the Limpsham Housing Needs Assessment, August 2019. This refers to attachments A and B that I've emailed you to. Page six of the survey, which is attachment B, clearly shows that there are 21, 21 applicants assessed as in need of affordable housing. Eight affordable homes are near completion, leaving a shortfall of 13. At a 40% affordable homes provision, the maximum size of this proposed site is 32, 32, not 40. Therefore, the development is out of scale with the housing needs survey, which itself is not current, being three years old. Again, non-compliant with local plan policy T3A, I quote, it fulfills an identified local housing need, no, for affordable housing, as evidenced by an up-to-date assessment of local housing, no. Thirdly, 
the removal of the entire existing hedgerow fronting the site 200 metres in length as a per attachment C and D. Note how Limpshaw Grove curves almost 90 degrees around the entire field, making it highly visible. The removal of the entire hedgerow is totally unnecessary and will have a hugely negative effect on the visual impact of this oversized development. The hedge contributes to the character and residential amenity of the settlement. Any opportunity for visual containment will be lost, in addition to a significant loss of habitat for existing wildlife. Again, in Strong Fox's own ecology report, it states, hedgerows are listed as a habitat of principal importance for the conservation of biodiversity in England. They are also a priority for conservation in the county, being listed as an important habitat in the Somerset Biodiversity Action Plan. This is contrary to the Hedgerow Regulations 97, Actually, Policy D22, D20, the local plan. I'll have to call time on you there. That's the, that's the three minutes. But thank no. you very much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Heather Allsop, if you'd like to come forward, please. Good morning. Again, you'll see the time of the clock start when you're ready, please. Thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of Limpsham Parish Council. The entire site lies in flood zone three, and the officer's report accepts this site as a high flood risk. The government flood risk assessment February 2017 is clear. A sequential test must be done if in zone three to determine if there are other sites available within Limpsham with a lower flood risk area. The case officer has confirmed that no sequential tests have been done on this site and their argument that the sequential test requirement has been met, given that all sites on the edge of Limpsham are in zone three, is legally very questionable indeed and should be confirmed by an external legal opinion before approval is given. The exception test must also be met and is only applicable if a sequential test has been done and it has not. The exceptions test requires Strongbox to produce proper evidence that the development would be safe should there be exceptional flood events arising from climate change. This should be done as part of a full planning application. Strongbox do not mention people with disabilities or the vulnerable, nor have they provided any detail as to the structural integrity of the buildings, as they've only submitted outline planning at this stage, so we don't know the structural integrity of the buildings as the information has been admitted. The Environment Agency, Internal Drainage Board and Lead Local Flood Authorities comments relate only to surface water flooding. Limpsham is the nearest village to the River Axe and close to the North Somerset coast. We are a village at risk of tidal flooding and the Environment Agency documents do not guarantee regional flood defences will protect areas in flood zone three if exceptional flood events arise from climate change. Condition 14 requires floor levels to be raised by half a metre above ground level, but doesn't mention the vulnerable as before, nor does it recognise flooding in event of climate change. Raising up half a metre may result in overshadowing and loss of light, lack of privacy for residents in the closest established road, the Worthings and Worthy Crescent. Neither conditions 14 or 15 protect future residents as they should, as per government guidance, and the site is unacceptable, dangerous, and development should be directed to an area of lower flood risk. Highways initially raised concerns but are now supported the application. However, the PC and Limpsham community believe the latest report seriously underestimates the congestion and danger around the village road and the junction onto the A370. During the summer, we have an influx of caravans, motorhomes, double decker buses using the road as a shortcut to Breen. With large loads being towed by huge tractors and trailers and big delivery lorries and milk, and milk tankers. None of these large vehicles can turn into the village if there are cars waiting at the junction to go out onto the A370 from the village, as the let lorries often have to turn and swing um, to a 90 degree angle and end up on both sides of the village road in order to, to get into the village. If vehicles are waiting at the junction, the large vehicles are unable to turn in and have to wait for those vehicles to move. So end up sitting on the A370 waiting to turn in, which is a dangerous hazard and frustrating for the road users who may end up end undertaking or overtaking when they shouldn't if they can't do so safely. With another potential 100 cars in Lynchon, this can only add to the congestion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Richardson, is that to come forward? Again, just to remind you, you've got three minutes and start when you're ready, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, by way of an introduction, my name is Bill Richardson. I'm planning manager at Strongbox Homes. Um, as many of you will know, we're a Taunton based company that takes pride in carefully uh, designed new homes. Our developments reflect local character and avoid more standard off the shelf uh, designs associ associated with PLC builders. 
you may be familiar with our local developments in Sedgemoor. In addition, we build across other parts of Somerset, Bristol and Devon. Prior to submitting the proposal, Strongvox undertook a full public consultation. Every household in the village was contacted and invited on their thoughts and suggestions. It was particularly, ple it was particularly pleasing to note um, the high level of support that was forthcoming for the application. In fact, nearly 50% of respondents supported the scheme with approximately 25% not sure and 25% raising concerns. This is unusually high when canvassing opinion on new housing development and is perhaps reflective of the historic undersupply of new homes, particularly affordable homes in the village in recent decades. This is best summarised in the following response from a local resident, and I quote, we're very pleased to support this proposal. It would appear to tick all the boxes for what is required in Limpsham. The provision of a footpath is especially welcome to provide safe means of access to the centre of the village, especially for children going to school. We are delighted to see an area that has been included with where wildlife can thrive. Also, access to the development both during and after building works have taken place will cause minimal disruption to allow the new residents easy access to the A370. It would also appear that the proposal is more than adequately covered uh, for more than adequate quickly covers local affordable housing need. So since submitting the application, Strongbox has worked closely with your officers and undertaken substantial design amendments. We've reduced the scheme from 50 to 40 dwellings. Furthermore, we've also met with Mr. Cole, a local resident opposite the site, um, and substantially reduced the number of homes presenting onto Limpsham Road as discussed by your planning officer including reorientating homes and setting them further from the road to ensure that no light glare would affect his house to the north of the origin as originally proposed. In response to Mr. Cole's concerns, we've also provided a setback that and, and setbacks that are well in excess of standard requirements along the northern fringe. I am pleased to report that no technical matters remain outstanding and the proposals have the support of all technical consultees. We are pleased to present a well-considered quality proposal that provides high level of affordable housing and a good mix of housing types and sizes. I thank you for your attention and hope that you are able to favourably consider this. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> Members, any comments or questions? I have Councillor Henry as indicated to start with. Okay, thank you, Chair. I could ask um, the case officer just to point out on the on the screen the hedge, the hedge hedge road that the first speaker mentioned and the ex entry point onto the road from the estate or the, the proposed estate. Sorry. It's the hedge road along Lipsham Road. So currently, this area is is a hedge road that is. Um, it's flailed and reduced to a certain level in accordance with agricultural fields on a fairly frequent basis, but it is an established hedgerow um, along this boundary. So to get the access in and to construct the footpath, um, that hedgerow is going to have to come out to enable the construction works, but it is being replanted to make sure you can get visibility splays in okay. from the proposed access. The existing access into the field at the moment is at this point here, so it's where the pedestrian path is going to cut out of the site. So currently you come in here and then there's a field gate in this location going into the first um, land parcel and the access road comes in and round like that and then you come into the second land parcel through another field gate about halfway down. Okay, sorry. On the, the council complaints or word as you like, uh, or the first speaker. So then this hedge row, the hedge row is coming out, but it's going to be replanted. Is that what we're saying? Yeah. So in actual fact, to say it's coming out is really not valid because it's going to be replanted anyway. Yeah, and, okay. and it has to be to enable the visibility spray, because otherwise okay. you wouldn't okay. be able to see. Uh, the provision of parking spaces is apparently and allegedly inadequate, but that's been proved by yourselves in actual fact. That's OK. Uh, no mention the point number five no mention of affordable housing provider on board now i'm not sure why they're saying that because we're talking about 16 affordable here is that right so that doesn't count either i no, i was just reading this earlier and it, it goes off my screen <laughs> all right okay 
I've lost on the screen now. It's gone off. In short, in short, the the they appoint the points number one to five by the, the local parish council saying against this. In actual fact, can all be countered and that's spoken against. And especially about the hedgerow, that was the one that concerned me the most. The entrance, I, I was a bit unsure about that because I wasn't just the way it was worded. It was going straight onto the A370, but it's not, is it? Yeah. No, no, it's not. OK, that's absolutely fine. Thank you for that. Um, just, just as one point of clarity, I think the speaker referred to the application as an outline application. It is actually a full application. It's not an outline, just, just for clarity. So the detailed plans you've got up in terms of the landscaping and the ecological mitigation, that's all the full detail that's before you at the moment for consideration. So it's not an outline. Councillor Bolt, can we pass the microphone down, please? Thank you. Thank you. Just coming down to the affordable housing, which we all yeah, appreciate is well needed. Are we in, able to ensure a guarantee that it will be provided and we won't get a viability um, return to planning on this application? Yeah, I, being aware of the site, I think you're referring to the viability issue. The, the policy that that particular site was granted under was an edge of settlement site that would have only needed 15% affordable housing. So it wasn't an exceptional release policy. It was just an edge of sustainable settlement policy. Um, with this one, it's an edge of settlement exceptional release policy. So it has to provide affordable housing. If it gets to the point where the affordable housing can't be delivered, and they come back for a viability appraisal, it, it again, similar to the last application, it takes away the policy justification for the development because it is an exceptional release policy, not an edge of sustainable settlement policy. So that would come back to enforcement? Um, well, they, they would need a fresh consent that we would have to consider. And if it's all market housing, it wouldn't comply with the policies in the local plan. Okay. Good timing, thank you. Thank you. Could I just raise a, a couple of queries if I could relating to, to some of the points raised by the speakers, I think, just for clarification if we can. Um, housing need was raised and the, the position of the housing need survey as to whether this is an over provision in terms of what is shown in the in the housing need and how that is justified. Um, there was also um, the issue that was raised about the sequential test yeah. and why we feel that that has been addressed and also uh, I've got a couple more here, but I'll start with those two if I can and then yeah. I'll come back. So the the housing needs, um, I have got a comment from the housing, um, the affordable housing manager who does confirm in terms of the property range that's being delivered. It's 13 social rented um, ranging between one and four bedroom properties. So social rent, one and four bedroom properties and three shared ownership. He was satisfied that, that complies with the outstanding requirements of the housing needs assessment. So based on that, I'm satisfied that the development and the size, scale and nature of the units that are proposed align with a current housing needs assessment for the site. Um, the second point was the sequential test. Um, the point of the sequential test is to primarily uh, locate development in the lowest flood risk zone possible. Um, because it's a local exception test, the local exception means it needs to be well related to um, this settlement boundary. In terms of looking at alternative sites on the edge of this settlement boundary, all of them are the same flood risk. So, you know, we haven't got any information from the applicant or agent um, looking at alternative sites, but there's no other alternative sites at lower flood risk that would justify asking for that exercise to be undertaken. So by nature of the policy, there's a requirement for it to be adjacent or well related to. Every site adjacent or well related to is the same flood risk. So there is no justification for sort of looking at alternative sites. If there were areas on the edge of the settlement boundary that were flood zone two or something like that, we would have gone back to them and said, investigate these sites and come back to us. But it's it's the same flood risk area and it's to meet an identified need in relation to that village. So it can't be located anywhere else further afield. OK, um, you showed us some plans also of, of the original one with 50. And obviously there's been an improvement in that in, in terms of reduced density, particularly on the area near Limpsham Road. Um, 
you also showed us an area that's being used for, I think you said it was flower meadow for offset. That's not within the red line, it's within a within the blue line, but there seemed to be land between it and the red line. So in terms of red blue line, they actually adjoin. Yeah. So so the red outline runs along this boundary, kicks out, and then they adjoin the red and blue. So the blue line is still within the applicant's ownership, um, which is what the specification is for the blue line. Um, and it is specified and will be referred to as part of the 106. So the plan that they've submitted for biodiversity enhancement. Shall we get to eventually? Um, which is this one. Um, will end up being an approved plan in the 106. So it will require its delivery as part of the 106. So, so if I can just clarify, in, in that plan we're looking at there, the, the biodiversity bit, is that the hatched yellow bit? Yeah, so it's 45 so metres of new hedging yep. that's going in in this location and 2,775 square metres of um, flower-rich meadow. And the space of white land between the meadow and the construction? At the moment, it's just arable. OK, um, so again, looking at the, the the proposals we have before us, as I say, the dense, the, the slight concern I have with it, I must admit, is the density of the rear area as well, that that's, that's remained quite dense compared with the, the, the rural nature of the site we're on. And it just surprised me that that white land hasn't been used to reduce the density potentially. Um, and I just wonder whether we're we're looking at we can't obviously decide on a future application, but I would hope we're not looking at another extension that suddenly we're back up to 50 because there's another bit of white land. Mm. But we'll we'll cross that bridge if and when we get to it. Um, if I could also just ask in terms of the hedgerow, obviously you've mentioned it's being replaced. If you, again, if you could just show me the, the, the hedgerow plan, because it is a large mature native hedge at the moment. There are a number of, I think you said the round bits are new trees going yeah. in is there a hedge you're saying underneath those trees as well yeah. as the so trees? i don't know if you can see this um hatch line across yeah. here so that hatch line there this hatch line along here um and there's also within the conditions requirements for root protection areas for the existing hedges that are to be retained just to make sure they're not damaged throughout construction okay as i say my, my slight concern at the moment is i feel that it, i mean obviously the developers have come a long way since the first application i'm just concerned that they haven't gone as far as they could have in terms of this is a very prominent site in a rural area we've heard about the significant size of the development in proportion to Limpsham and the fact they've already had a big develop well for them a large development uh, earlier so I'm yet to make my mind up finally on this one but I would like to hear the rest of the debate um, one final thing I would just ask and I know you would expect me to if you saw all the photographs of the surrounding properties, they have roof treatments that involve chimneys. This is a rural area. I noticed the design of all of these don't reflect that. And I think that would be something, should this go ahead, um, would certainly help it acclimatise to the village rather than being a, a modern development. Um, I'm looking for any other comments from any other members at the moment. So I've got Councillor Revens. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I think, like you, I, I'm, I'm concerned about the scale um, of this and how it fits with the existing character mm. of the settlement. Um, quite alarmed to hear this is this is I've, I've, I've seen various figures from 17 and a half percent to 25 percent increase in the size of a village which is all in exceptional sites which seems to be that this is what the word scale is in the policy for I would assume is to limit excessive development around um, small settlements such as Limpsham. Um, so that's my my first that's my first concern uh, around this application. I think that's a fundamental principle in this is the size. Um, secondly, I would look at this at the the um, affordable housing uh, needs survey. My understanding is that's that's several years old, and these are always a snapshot. Um, would, for, a, for a development of this size, um, I would perhaps expect us to go back to that and, and, and look at what the need actually is. 
um, currently. Part of the need would have been met, I understand, by the other site in Limpsham. So I just want to understand what is what are the numbers here in terms of what's been provided by the other sites, what is being provided by this site, and what confidence we have that this affordable needs housing survey is uh, is accurate for the current state. That seems a remarkably high level of affordable need uh, affordable needs housing for a settlement of 235. Thank you. Mr. Um, the housing needs assessment is coming up to three years old. Um, it is a snapshot in time, so it was accurate as of three years ago. Documents do age, so things will change. Um, in the time since the housing needs survey um, to the current day, um, there hasn't been a massive provision of affordable housing to meet the identified needs that were set out three years ago. Um, on page 61, there's a paragraph um, just setting out confirmation from the affordable housing manager. Um, that permission has been granted for eight affordable homes at Bex Farm in West Road under 31-1909. Um, but under the um, housing needs assessment, there was a need for 25 new dwellings, which leaves 16 after taking away the development at Bex um, Farm. So in terms of the amount that's being provided and the mix that's being provided, that's all been agreed with the affordable housing manager in terms of it complying with the housing needs assessment. Um, in terms of age, you know, they do tend to hold less and less weight the older they get. So they do have a shelf life of about three to four, three to five years, I think. Um, but it's, it's a financial obligation on the council if the council wished to run another one, which would take a number of months and some finance to go into to update or refresh the housing needs assessment. Thank you. Um, Mr. Cole's helpfully provided us with. Uh, the affordable needs housing survey. I'm seeing the number 21 in it, not number 25. This is the information I've got from the housing needs affordable housing manager. Stuart, that's what's being sent to members. The extract. Yeah, really helpfully, we haven't seen the information that's come into members. Oh. The table shows 25. I don't know which year survey this is. So there are two references. Is, is that 22? Is that 2019 or Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I mean, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm going to need to defer to the main document myself because yeah. I can't just take it as a page. No, it's, understood. It's that, you as, you said, the as you say, they're never quite sorry. They're never quite as straightforward to read. I accept. As this and and this does say it says the table below provides an at glance insight into the assessed affordable housing need of people with local connection to Limpsham, totaling 21 local individuals or families. But there is further, in, in, you know, that information gets further put forward, and it's sort of at the end where the conclusion comes. This is on page six. I need to refer to it. So. Um, I'm happy if we want to break for five minutes whilst yeah. I go and look at that. Our members are happy that we do that. Members we'll just, are happy with that? We'll take a, a so five minute journey and, and then we'll we'll come. Members, if we can restart uh, and we'll carry on. So if I can come to, is it Mr Howlett or Mr De Vries? I'll start. OK, please do. Okay, Chairman, thank you. Uh, firstly, apologies yeah. for this, um, members of the public. Um, we should have had the information to hand. So. Do, do, and I should have had the mic close. Yeah, apologies, members, for this and to the members of the public. Uh, we should have had this information at hand. So apologies to run for it now. Um, so as you can see, this is uh, I'll take you through a couple of the pages and the numbers just to say that it, you know, it is 25. But there is one area which looks like it's a typo that I can understand why where some of the confusion has come from. This is page uh, page three, I think, of the actual uh, housing needs assessment and so you can see it's a bit of a summary at the start that says that 30 surveys were returned 
Of those, 25 of the survey's respondents were assessed as having a need for some affordable housing, and three were assessed as having a need for market housing. Of these 27, some have, uh, of, sorry, of these, 27 have some form of connection with the parish of Limpsham. Okay. If I, if I then take you back through to the page that I think you've been sent, or you've seen, because that's the page that I was shown a, a moment ago, it does say here, um, the paragraph towards the top there, the tables below provide an at-glance insight into the assessed affordable housing need of people with a local connection to Limpsham, totaling 21 local individuals or families. So that is at odds with the figure that I presented at the summary. And then further, under current housing circumstances, it then says, of the current 24 who have a strong connection with Limpsham, and the one who had not stated their connection with Limpsham, but who are considered to be in housing need and would require help to access an affordable home in the parish. So that's 24 plus 1 is 25. So we've, it, 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 it seems to be that 21 figure that is at odds. Because then if we look at the tables below, number of respondents, they all add up to 25. So housing need, number of respondents, 979, 25. Local connection, 14, 4, 6, 1 is 21, uh, 25. And then at the bottom, bottom, those numbers add up to 25 as well. And then on the summary and recommendations at the bottom, it does say um, here, assessed overall Limpsham housing affordable uh, housing need, total 25. So the 25 does carry through. Um, Esther Carter, who uh, works in the affordable housing team, has also messaged to confirm it is 25 and is also available on meeting to answer any questions if any comes up. And apologies, we should have had someone from the affordable housing team here because it is a crucial matter, absolutely crucial matter in terms of the application. So hopefully that clarifies where we are on the housing needs assessment. Councillor Evans. Thank you. Um, could I ask in supplementary, first of all, we can see there the, or we could see there, I see it's just gone, um, the breakdown by bedroom, number of bedrooms um, that is, given what's being put forward here and what's being put forward at the other side, does that meet the assessed need from three years ago? Yeah, okay. And do we have a plan as to how the affordable housing is distributed in the development of this estate? Yes, uh, to both of those. If I just switch seats again. Okay. Right, so hopefully you can see that layout. Um, what you may just be able to work out is the dots. So the dots are the affordable housing that are shown in this location, that location, this location. This um, building is the one bed flat. So it's, it's been arranged as a one bed flat and that was the centralised larger building that I showed on the, on the elevation plans earlier. So uh, is my reading of this plan correct that they're in two clusters? both on the right hand side, I presume the east of the site. Is that correct? Yeah, so there's an area in this location and then again, sort of a, a broader area with different frontages in this. That's market housing, so it's it's more within a mixed cluster at the bottom. Um, given the degree of social rented, the rented accommodations do tend to sit sort of slightly close together just so they can be managed and monitored appropriately. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think in, I think the there's, there was another question that I, I think was in the parish council's um, submission, which I think Councillor Henry may have misinterpreted, which was about the housing, the affordable housing provider. Has a provider been identified for these yet? Do we know? Um, I don't know, but they will be required to be identified as part of the 106. OK, thank you. Thank you very much. I've got Councillor Pierce. In which case, I've got Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Betty. Thank 
Hello? Yeah. I did that for Brian Bolton. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of things on this paperwork here that just I don't get at all. If I just ask the case officer. I know it's been amended, but OK. Coastal and land drainage objection, Southwest Heritage Trust, oh, that the objection. Environment Agency objection, the IDB objection. Uh, OK. How did that come to suddenly change to be OK if it was objected in the first place? And like the IDB, because if they're object, this is usually quite quite stringent. But how did all this come to be? No objection and then suddenly, sorry, not no, to be objection and then to be overturned. And second thing, I have to keep coming back to this hedgerow. I'm not happy about this at all. If you've got an established hedgerow and you want to cut through to make a, um, an entry exit point, why does the whole thing have to come out? to be replanted if it's uh, if it's a, a thick, good old hedgerow that's, that's established. Why does the whole thing have to come out completely and go back to basics? But uh, anyway, that's my two points. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the report was set out that you've got all the original comments to the development of 50 houses set out first in the consultation. Then we had the revisions in terms of 40 houses and um, a, a big range of additional information, including revised drainage information, revised flood risk assessment. There was quite long ongoing negotiations between the developer and the IDB in terms of what their concerns were with the development and how to address those. So it, it didn't happen overnight. It was quite a, a lengthy process. But as a result of that process, the 40 dwellings scheme was submitted with all the appropriate supporting information and as a result of that the statutory consultees are now all satisfied with the proposal and the additional details that have been provided um i just thought i'd highlight the hedge um you know this lvia so this is this is a photo from limpsham road looking across um parcel a so that's the pair of properties on the opposite side of the road because the road bends around and goes to the front here um this is the hedge that that would be coming out it is like many sort of roadside hedges sort of reduced to quite a minimum height sort of quite frequently in terms of just management and maintenance of the site. So that would come out as part of the development. Um, in terms of the layout, the reason you require the hedge to come out is that you need appropriate visibility displays from this access um, leading in this direction to get good um, oversight. I think the junction to the A roads just off the picture. And again, particularly for this one, because of the bend in the road, you need the visibility display here to cut across the front to be able to see to the maximum point to be able to get safe displays so you can see oncoming traffic. So if if the hedgerow was retained from the previous photo, the hedgerow currently runs right on the edge of the boundary. So you can't retain it in its current form without taking it out to reinstate it to get the visibility displays in. Thank you. I've got uh, Councillor Betty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I notice on the original submissions, the Parks and Gardens team objected due to the drainage being below the proposed laps and leaps. However, they haven't commented on the revised submission. Is this due to the drainage being sorted or have they just not commented and is it still an objection from them? The um, comment from the Parks and Gardens team is that it's it's basically a warning to the developer. They don't adopt public open space if it's over attenuation tanks. That's because in the um, event that anything goes wrong with the attenuation tank, you'd have to take up all the um, sort of play equipment off the top and, and go in and, and mitigate it. There were quite long discussions between the developer and the lead local flood authority in terms of making sure that the attenuation tanks are going to go down um, are appropriate in terms of um, not likely to fail, um, but we we still, as a local authority, wouldn't be adopting the play spaces, so it'd go to a management company. But again, that would be tied up in the 106. It doesn't make it unacceptable, it just means we wouldn't adopt it. Thank you. Any further comments or questions from members? If not, I'm going to be looking for a recommendation, please. <clears throat> I've got Councillor Kingham and I think Councillor Revens, but I'll start with Councillor Kingham. Um, well, move some my thunder in a little bit, Chairman, regarding design of these houses as they're a rural 
setting and a lot of the houses that are in the area have chimneys. But um, I'd like, I'll move the recommendation, Chan, with those conditions. Okay. Is that seconded? Councillor Granter? Okay, so we have a <coughs> recommendation to grant permission um, with an amendment to to see the roofscapes adapted with chimneys, I think you were saying. Okay. Um, and that was seconded by Councillor Granter. I have no other recommendations put before me, so those in favour of that recommendation, please show. Uh, those against, please show. Five. And any abstentions? Three. Yes, please, three. See one, two, ah, three, thank you. Three, eight, four. Does that make 14? Yeah. That makes 14. <laughs> so in which case that is permission granted uh, six to five to three. So at which point I'm going to suggest again we take a short comfort break of, of five minutes and then we'll restart with the other two applications for the small page 84 please and uh, Bridgewater. And I think Emma, you're presenting this one. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning. Uh, this is an application for the erection of a single dwelling house and the demolition of an existing garage at 35 Mendip Road within Bridgewater. This application site is shown here um, in that top corner. Uh, it's within a built up residential area in to the east of Bridgewater. A slightly closer kind of aerial image there to just show that it's this semi detached property here at the end of uh, the terrace um, along Mendip Road, and that's Avalon Road that it um, adjoins to the east. Yeah, uh, sorry. You're not presenting through the team's meeting. Oh, how did I do that? No. Okay, we've got a plan on there now. Sorry. Apologies. That's okay. Carry on. If I just... Hold up. Yes. Um, Councillor Glassford and I have just realised that we didn't declare an interest on this item. So if we could add that to the list, please. Okay, certainly. No problem. Ms. Charlie, do you want to... Go again. Thank you, Chairman. Apologies. Uh, so, yes, uh, application for the erection of a single dwelling house and demolition of an existing garage at 35 Mendip Road. Uh, here you should be able to see uh, the application site um, to the top corner um, of uh, Mendip Road here and Avalon Road to the east. Um, it's within a built up residential area to the east of Bridgewater. And slightly closer aerial image there for you, um, just showing the application property that it is at the moment and this is the area in which the new dwelling would is proposed and the location plan just to confirm and this is the proposed site plan and block plan uh, so the proposal originally as submitted was for a pair of semi-detached dwellings um, that would be separate from the existing terrace and we uh, did consider that to be an overdevelopment of the plot um, and following some negotiations with the applicant, uh, we've got a revised scheme in for a single dwelling to be attached to the terrace. Um, as you can see there, it's proposed that we slightly step back from the existing terrace, which uh, you can see on the properties just to the south, 53 Avalon Road is similarly um, slightly stepped back. So it will kind of reflect the build lines within the area. Uh, property will provide uh, three bedrooms, uh, two parking spaces to serve the existing dwelling to the front and two parking spaces are proposed to serve the new dwelling. Uh, to facilitate the development, the existing garage uh, that sits to the rear of number 35 um, and adjacent to number 53 Avalon Road will need to be demolished. Uh, just the ground and first floor plans of the dwelling, as you see the three bedrooms there at first floor. 
um, and the new dwelling slightly step back from that existing um, dwelling. Uh, material finishes are to match the existing terrace, so you've got the render to the first floor um, being a feature along Mendip Road um, and the brick finish uh, to the, the kind of ground floor. And this is shown again in the photograph, so you can see the existing property 35 Mendip Road, both kind of looking at, uh, directly at it um, and the application site and then kind of further around the corner so you can see that step back on Avalon Road as well. Um, but as you can see, the material palette proposed um, kind of reflects what, what is existing. Uh, this is the property opposite on Mendip Road, um, which uh, you can see benefits from a two storey extension itself. The proposed dwelling is obviously larger, it's a greater width, so whilst it will mirror that stepping back, it will project further into its plot. Um, but as you could hopefully see from the site plan, it will retain a, a degree of openness around that corner. Uh, so just to confirm the key issues, the application site is within the settlement boundary um, of Bridgewater. So the principle of development is acceptable subject to a detailed assessment of the site constraints. Um, in this case, following the renegotiation of the scheme and the reduction from two to one, um, together with the design changes, it's considered that is an appropriate size, scale and design. Um, some amenity concerns have been raised um, with regards to potential overlooking um, of a bathroom window in uh, 53 Avalon Road. If I just briefly go back, um, you can see in that top photograph, that's that's the window. Um, it is possible to obscure glaze uh, the window that would overlook um, from the neighbouring property. That's uh, a condition that's recommended. And given the separation distance, it's not considered that this would be an unacceptable impact. Um, highway safety concerns have also been raised. Um, Somerset County Highways have confirmed initially standing advice uh, to both the original scheme and the current scheme before you. Um, to the original scheme, we did have concerns as to and asked them to review their, their comments and they confirmed they would have no objection um, to the two dwelling scheme. Um, so they've come back and confirmed that again, standing advice is to apply equally to the first one. Uh, the parking standards uh, would ask for two spaces plus visitor parking for a three bedroom property in this area. Uh, two spaces are proposed. Uh, the 0.2 visitor space isn't considered to be uh, sufficient to warrant any sort of refusal and they haven't raised any concerns about um, visibility, um, obviously within this sort of area. Um, there are permitted development rights in terms of uh, creating hard standing and driveway spaces to the front of your property, uh, so do you need to bear that in mind. Uh, flood risk assessment has been produced um, to confirm that it can provide uh, sufficient measures to overcome the flood risk. And in terms of ecology, there is uh, biodiversity enhancements that can be secured as part of the scheme. So subject to conditions on that basis, uh, that it's recommended to grant approval. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from members? I've got Councillor Hendry first. Hello. Okay. Um, I apologise here. I didn't know who this applicant was until just now, and I don't think I should be here. Uh, Mr Neil Edwards, he's done work for me in the past several times. He's a builder, and I know him really well, and I'm not sure I should be sitting in on this. Position. The, the, the applicant, Mr Neil Edwards, I know this fellow really well. He's a builder, done work for me several times in the past, and I know him really well, so I'm not sure I should be sitting in on this. I didn't know who it was until just now. Um, then it will be, you will be, um, you will be um, classed as a personal interest with a close association. Okay. But if that close association is so close that it could um, prejudice your yeah. views, yeah. you like should be leave? sitting out as predetermined. Do you want me to leave the room? Yes, please. Okay. <laughs> Councillor Bolt. Just uh, a quick one. Looking at the um, view of the pictures and the uh, that you showed, that, that it's the bottom one there. Um, looking at the plan and looking at that, that's not going to come out of line of the, is it Avalon Road that runs along there, number 53? It's, so it's not going to be out of line of that run of houses, is it? 
Uh, so it projects slightly further across if um, oh, yeah, I can see it there now. site plan shows so this is the width of the proposed new property. It will project then 53 is step back. Um, then there is a slight projection um, over and in front of it, but it's not considered that that's so significant as is to be unacceptable. I think I can't, can't see any problem with this at all. Thank you. OK. Councillor Kingham next to Councillor Bolt. Councillor Kingham. Thank you. Go the right way around, didn't you? Um, I was looking at the objections from the town council regarding overdevelopment and highway safety. Um, under the highways, I've got standard advice, so they haven't caused any a problem with this. Um, I don't see a problem. I don't see as it's over overdevelopment or, or taking away um, anybody's view. So I have no problem with this. So I'd like to uh, move the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. Second that. Then. Okay. Any further comments or questions from members? In which case, we've had the recommendation moved and seconded to grant permission. Those in support, please show. That's unanimous. Really carried. Can we get uh, Councillor Hendry back? And if you turn to page 92, please. And again, we're back in Bridgewater and Mr. Titchener, you're introducing the one, please. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, so um, it's an application at land at uh, Clare Street in Bridgewater. So it um, includes um, enhancement works at Clare Street. So new street furniture, signage, resurfacing and associated works. It's before members today because the applicant is Sedgemoor District Council. Uh, so it's um, Many, many people will be very familiar with the location because it's just around the corner from our offices. Uh, so it's just a small area of Clare Street here. Uh, so just to the sort of north side of the town centre, uh, the main parts of the town centre road running through here. And just a zoomed in view here. So this is Clare Street where it pulls off of, um, off the road here. So the works are primarily within this uh, area here bounded by uh, a number of uh, buildings many that many people will be familiar with the nutmegs sort of cafe great restaurant a great escape restaurant um, and so and there's existing seating outside uh, the nutmeg at the moment and there's a number of other uh, retail premises uh, within the area uh, so there's a, a hairdressers I believe there's a, a takeaway a number of the buildings uh, around the site are listed buildings so the red line just shows the extent of the application encompassing the uh, areas of um, uh, sort of primary areas of uh, uh, of the roadway, the highway within the site, but it also includes a little bit section on Castle Moat related to the provision of some disabled parking spaces that I'll come on to in a moment. This is a, um, uh, a detailed sort of layout plan showing what's proposed as part of the works. Um, Overall, the project is part of the Council's Celebration Mile schemes, uh, which has been a long-standing strategic aspiration for improvement works from the Bridgewater Railway Station all up St John Street uh, through the town centre and ultimately to the docks. Um, uh, the, there are a number of bespoke projects as part of that, but some are, uh, have already come to fruition or in the process of going to fruition, such as like Northgate and some other projects currently in the works, which members will see applications for in uh, probably later in this year related to Angel Crescent and Eastover. So all within bespoke projects. So this one will deliver public realm improvements at Clare Street. So the proposal is for the area to, to become a pedestrianised zone uh, with uh, vehicle entry limited to access only. There are changes to surface treatments uh, throughout, including the narrowing the width of the carriageway. Uh, new lighting is proposed, street furniture, uh, new trees. So there's new three new specimen trees, uh, specimens uh, selected um, and approved by our council's landscape and tree officer. Um, so the space, the idea is for the space to improve the experience for pedestrians and allow greater space for outdoor seating and potentially for events to be held there or like market type uh, stalls to be located in the area. The proposal is to include sort of PowerPoints to, to facilitate that type of activity. 
So this just shows some of the paving treatments. So high quality new paving materials are going to be proposed throughout. Um, so that is, that's going to include the use of things like pennant flag paving and granite sets. Um, the proposals, given the conservation area location, the fact it's ringed by listed buildings, uh, do have the support of the council's conservation officer. Um, a condition is proposed for them to have the oversight of the specific types of paving proposed to make sure it's appropriate to the conservation and heritage uh, setting. And just zooming in, as I mentioned, these are the specimen trees, so these will be quite prominent and near the entrance to the site. Uh, so um, there's currently um, no, no trees within that area, uh, so that will provide some, some greening uh, and improve the attractiveness as a place, of the place as a place to, to linger and spend time. And then just in terms of um, highway sort of changes, so um, ultimately the goal of the whole project is to improve the, ex the experience for pedestrians, partly as a route through the site and ultimately through Angel Crescent to, to, to Northgate. Um, uh, so there are to be three new disabled spaces provided here on Castle Moat, uh, so, uh, so, that, so that access is still retained. Um, the Highway Authority have been involved in pre-application discussions previously uh, on this scheme and have commented on this application. They raised no objection um, given their detailed discussions uh, at pre-application stage. Uh, so they are satisfied. Um, there will need to be a subsequent legal agreement, but that sits out of planning. That sits under the Section 278 of the Highway Act uh, so, um, to control the actual physical works to, to the street. Um, the operator of um, uh, Nutmeg Cafe Restaurant uh, had written in, as one of the few people that written in, stated they explicitly supported the scheme, it's beneficial for them, had some concern that about the potential of impact of the works during construction or the operation of the, their business. That issue has been flagged with the council's in-house project team who are working on the proposals. They are in discussions with the, that operate, uh, operator of that business to minimise the impact on that business as much as is physically possible. Um, Ultimately, the aim of the project is to is to be for the benefit of such businesses. So it's in the council's interest to um, minimise such disruption. They're going to be in discussions as we progress, as the council progresses to those pre-construction phases. Um, but that dialogue's are happening uh, already, and the operator, as I understand, is satisfied with that process. Just briefly, we just legally need to touch on the public sector equality duty. There is a duty under the under the Equalities Act to have due regard to uh, eliminate discrimination, advance equality of opportunity and foster good relations between different people when carrying out such activities. Um, we've touched on this on applications previously. There's a number of protected characteristics under the Equalities Act. Uh, in particular, what's relevant here is, is disability. And as I've mentioned, the proposal includes new dedicated disabled parking in close proximity to the site to the benefit of uh, people with that protected characteristic so that um, so that they still maintain access to, uh, and have places dedicated places to park in proximity to the town centre. So it's not considered that any other protected group is specifically impacted by the nature of the proposals. So our duties we would consider under the Act are considered um, uh, to have to have been carried out and I just want to show just some illustrative um, uh, images of what the changes might um, uh, might look like. These are illustrative, so there's always that caveat it's to bear in mind. Um, but uh, this is looking in from the existing junction, and this you can see sort of the, the increase in size of the footways. There's some of the changes in surface treatments that, that's proposed. Uh, again, looking at Nutme uh, Nutmeg House and the Great Escape. So the um, uh, the changes to surfacing, the inclusion of the trees outside. Uh, again, looking slightly deeper into the site, existing uh, where you can see the cars sort of parking on there. And now you've got greater space for outside uh, seating and eating outside those restaurants. And then looking back, standing within the site, looking back out again, you can see um, what's the, the intention to create a more pedestrian friendly space. Um, so ultimately, it's part of the council's strategic vision, the um, Bridgewater uh, the Cele Celebration Mile projects. It will deliver high quality public realm and improves the visual qualities of the area. So the recommendation is that permission should be granted. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from members, please? Yeah, Council Pierce. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I um, do support this, this scheme, but I have a couple of questions. Well, as, as you saw from the photographs, and that was typical of uh, legal parking that just happens all the time. Uh, so this, if this resolves that, 
on its own, it will be worth it. And I'm glad that there are disabled parking spaces for those who genuinely can't walk too far for the well-used local cash point. But my questions are, um, is there something that would be actually a physical barrier to prevent cars going on there? Because it's it's old habits, and I'm sure even though it, the area is improved and paved, some will still try. And it's also like the legacy of this, because we've had decorative paving in other areas. And then when it comes a few years on, there's no money to repair the decorative paving when it needs repairing and we get horrible tarmac infills. Is there anything that can be done to put a, a responsibility for ongoing repair? Just in there. So, so in regards to um, uh, the first point about a barrier, um, there's still some uh, some of the premises on uh, on Clare Street have a legal right of access. So the proposals are that it's pedestrianised, but with access only. So they couldn't preclude put a barrier down because some of those properties do need to be able to access. So like, I think it's Nutmeg has got a space outside uh, some of their properties. So that wouldn't be possible, unfortunately. Though I understand, you know, the concern about um, about vehicles um, moving in. They should be the only people that should be should be driving in there by taking the point. In terms of the quality of the material. I think that's something that was flagged up by the council's conservation officer because there's been other schemes, other public realm schemes that have gone in and there has been some deterioration in the quality of materials over time and then the repair work that's gone in um, hasn't been to the same specification. What the, the project team have said and the and, and the the conservation officer is keen to be much more involved in actually the method of the way they lay these things in there just to try and learn lessons from the previous experience and trying to avoid that as much as possible. I don't think it won't be possible to remove all defects and predict all defects, but the project team managing it are going to involve the um, conservation officer quite closely in the method statement for the laying of the paving so they can try and minimise some of these. You know, they are they're aware of it. They want to minimise it as much as is possible. Okay, Councillor Bolt. Oh, uh, just carry on from uh, Councillor Pierce's comment. It, can we not um, have that as permit holders only down there? As part of the uh, plan? Because that would then restrict it to a button on the windscreen and that would be it. I guess what's there, what's happening here is there's quite a bit of overlap here with our processes and the subsequent processes that actually have to be agreed through a traffic regulation order by the county council. So mm -hmm. we are effectively agreeing the changes to the surface treatment and you know the, the street furniture and things like that. The actual rights of access and the controls of that don't really sit with us. They sit with the county council who have to go for a separate TRO. So it's not within, within our gift to change those rights. The, the, the applicant, as County Council uh, Sedgmore, will have to apply for a TRO uh, through the County Council to control access rights. So there's only so much that we have the control over as part of this application. I take your point. Um, as you said, Sedgmore is the, uh, the holder of all of this. Surely that could be part of the conditions. The, the issue with TROs, because we've, we've had this on some applications, we can only require, if we think it's necessary, we can only require the applicant, in this case ourselves, um, to apply for a TRO, because the TROs are then subject to consultation with everyone that's affected. And if there's any objections from anyone that's affected, it may um, jeopardise the TRO being implemented. So it is another separate process that has to go through another loop. Um, if members felt that knowing the outcome of that was pivotal to making a decision on the application, um, then we'd have to discuss internally with colleagues. But when we've imposed TROs previously on applications, the only thing we can do is impose the requirement to apply for a TRO and implement at your own cost. But as, as a local authority, we would be looking for the best outcome anyway, but I think it falls quite comfortably outside of planning. Um, but you know, it's a separate process that has to go through a separate consultation that can't be signed off by us at this stage. I've got Councillor Kingham and then Councillor Henry. Councillor Kingham. Um, I know you've got access only, presumably that's for deliveries to the premises that haven't got rear entrance. Will there be a weight limit on those vehicles? The answer to that is I don't know. 
um, it, it is a matter that falls under the TRO process. Um, um, Councillor Evans looks like, he's, like he probably knows more than me on this one and may want to inter intervene. Uh, Councillor Evans, what, I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to the answer that Mr. Freese gave a moment ago about TROs. Um, but it's, it's a set proposed process that wouldn't be in full, um, full through the planning process, but I'm sure officers will have heard and can make those representations to the Highways Authority. Uh, yeah. Would that be a correct summation of the situation? I was just going to say, in terms of the scheme, there is quite detailed engagement with County Highways in terms of um, designing, processing materials. So as part of anything that goes with that, they will be looking at the impact of any sort of loading or, or weight limitations on the surfacing that's been agreed. Because if we've agreed that finish, it will have a degree of wear and tear and a, a degree of resilience with it. Um, you know, if it doesn't, and they'd have to come back in for a different scheme, which would be materially different from what members have currently got before them. OK, Councillor Hendry. Thank you. <coughs> Sorry, <Brian. laughs> I think it's a very, very attractive, well thought out, well planned scheme. Um, I absolutely think it's just terrific and will enhance the town of Bridgewater immensely. And I want to bring forward the case officer's recommendation proposed grant permission. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Betty and then Councillor Evans. Thank you, Chairman. I think this is a great improvement to the area of that part of Bridgewater, and I'm happy to second Councillor Hendry's recommendation. Thank you. And I'm not seeing anyone else indicating at this point. So we have the recommendation to grant permission to be moved and seconded. Those in support, please show. That's unanimously carried. So that's Granted. Right, members, if you can turn to the reports page of your uh, papers, uh, item 8.1, and I'll head over to, sorry, uh, 150. First one is planning appeals received. Anything there, Mrs. DeVries? Just come share okay yeah we're getting yeah we're there now um right so um planning appeals received we've got um an application for erection of a dwelling at 7a trevor road in bridgewater it was delegated refusal um but that's been received um we've also got a certificate of lawfulness for existing use of a dwelling without um being in compliance with an agricultural tie so they were trying to prove that they've been in breach of the condition for over 10 years um, again, we refuse that, and that's currently been submitted to appeal. Okay, I'm not seeing any comments or questions on those. So, 8.2 certificates of lawfulness. So, we've um, granted planning permission for a certificate of lawfulness to confirm commencement of a 2013 condition. So, they commenced um, without necessarily providing us um, discharge of condition details. Um, but we were satisfied based on the information that we've received. Um, they haven't breached the consent and they did actually implement in time. So the consent is live and valid. Thank you. Again, no comments or questions. So 8.3, which is section 106, is issued. Yeah, so we've um, issued um, erection of a building for reception offices and two dwellings to be used as manager accommodation and formation of mugger, tennis courts and a skateboard park at Mill Farm. Um, we've also issued um, a two-storey extension with um, installation of a rear Juliet balcony, partially on site um, of the existing outbuildings, Hillview, and uh, land between Fryan Street and Broadway, which was um, a consent for 43 flats um, over two blocks, associated access parking, means of space and landscaping. Not see any comments or questions. So that's thank you very much. That concludes the business for this morning. So if we uh, close the meeting for this morning, I would just say, sorry. Right, good afternoon, everyone. It's two o'clock, so we'll uh, start the meeting. Uh, can I welcome you all to the Development Committee? I'm Councillor Filmer, I'm Chairman of the Committee. Um, just a couple of housekeeping notes um, before we start. Um, fire drills, I've not been advised that we have any of the plans, so if alarms go off, they are real. Your exits are through the side and the doors that you came in. Um, 
If you need toilet facilities during the meeting, they're located through the double doors at the back of the room. Uh, there are there's water and glasses available at the side of the hall. And if I could ask both members and members of the public, if you've got mobile phones, um, can you please make sure they're either turned off or turned to silent just so they don't get picked up by the PA or interfere with the meeting? So again, you know who's in front of you this afternoon. To my right are officers from our democratic services and legal section, and to my left are the planning officers who will be outlining uh, the applications before us this afternoon. On the wings of the tables are the councillors who will be debating and ultimately deciding our applications today. The, the meeting this afternoon is, is uh, being carried out as a hybrid meeting uh, in that it's we're obviously meeting within the, the canal side as the committee, uh, but we are also online through teams uh, and we will have some presentations uh, and some of the members of the public who will be speaking will be joining us through that uh, method. I should just point out that only councillors who are in the room and are present throughout a, a, an application are able to vote on that application. Uh, the format of the meeting is as per the agenda that's been published uh, and a copy of, for those who are joining us online, a copy of those presentations can be found on the, the, the Council's web pages. We'll take each application in turn this afternoon. Uh, we'll have the presentation from the officers and I will then ask those members of the public who've registered to speak to come forward to the speakers table or, or join us as say online. And when, when, when that happens, um, you will be uh, limited with the amount of time you can have, but I'll explain that in a bit more detail in a moment. Uh, when we get through the, the discussion and the debate, we will have the members will have, have raised issues that they wish to have questions uh, addressed. Uh, once that has happened, we will have a proposal from a member and that will be seconded to either grant, uh, refuse or defer an application and we'll need reasons for those when they come forward. And then we will take a vote uh, at that point and, and we will announce the, the result. If we move on then to the uh, agenda itself, uh, we've got item one is apologies for absence for this afternoon. Do we have any apologies, please? Thank you, Chairman. We've received apologies from Councillor Galanta for this afternoon's meeting. Thank you very much. Item three is urgent business. I've not been advised of any urgent business, which isn't already on our agenda. Uh, public speaking time, as I mentioned before, um, we will have the presentations. We'll then ask the members of the public who've registered to come forward and speak. Uh, I would just point out that you have three minutes to address the committee. You'll see there's a clock on the on the table at the front, which counts the time down, so you see how much time you've got left to go. Uh, for those who are speaking to us today online, uh, I recognise that you can't see <laughs> you can't see the clock. So what we will do on that instance is we will give you a a verbal warning when there's a minute. Uh, to go, so I will interrupt you and just let you know that there's that amount of time to go so that you can start to uh, draw your conclusions uh, and, and your comments to a, co a full conclusion. If we move then on to item five, uh, decorations of interest, are there any decorations for this afternoon's business? I'll start with Councillor Bolt. Thank you. Um, item 106, I'm the uh, County Councillor for the area. Thank uh, you. It's within the division, not taking part in any conversations. OK. Any other decorations? Yes, Councillor Grimes. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, pages 98 and 138. It's in my county division, but I've taken no part in any decisions. Thank you. And I need to make the same decoration as Councillor Grimes on the same two applications. Uh, 98 and 138 as they're within my my camp division as well uh, for members of the public it's important if if members have an interest in an application or some background councillor scott. Ah, scott somebody pass the microphone to me please thank you thank you um i ought to declare um an interest in the last one here four nine twenty one zero 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 twenty um is it within my ward and i'm actually speaking to it so just to confirm that, so it's a predetermination that you've already made up your mind on it. OK. So for members of the public, as I say, it's important that you know if members have got a background to an application have been involved in it in any way. We have a standing order with on this on this uh, particular committee, which says that members can either be involved at the parish and town council level when it's debated, or they can be involved at the district level. This is to avoid something that's called 
predetermination in effect making your mind up before you've come to the committee and that the, if you have been involved in that decision making earlier potentially have cast a vote at another body it might be perceived that you already made your mind up before you came here so to avoid that uh, possibility members either as i say get involved at the town and parish level or they get involved here and, and so you've heard the declarations today from a number of members they took no part which enables them to continue in the case of, of councillor scott as she said she's been involved in this application she's actually commented on it with a particular view and therefore she has made her mind up at that stage so she can speak as a speaker as a registered to do so but will then have to leave the room and take no part in any further discussion or debate on that application okay. councillor kingham Sorry to catch up, sir, Chairman. Yeah, um, declaring interest on pages one, two, nine. I will, I will, I will come to one, two, nine in a minute. You don't need to declare an interest on that. Uh, the reason being that application has been withdrawn from our agenda today. Uh, there is some further information that's required in terms of of land ownership and the notices being served. So it is likely to come back to us again in the future, but it will not be heard today. All right, I won't do that. Thank you. Thanks for trying. Right, members, if we move then to the planning applications themselves and page 98, the first application we have is in the parish of East Brent. And Mr Evans, I think you're introducing this one for us, please. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, this application relates to uh, Wyadale Farm, which is located within the countryside near Loxton. OK, so the site itself is located uh, by the circle here. Um, so we have a collection of buildings located here uh, with the primary farmhouse and a number of barn conversions that have been granted consent for residential use, um, all of which served by a single access with an access track leading off to the main farm and then also uh, another access track leading through the site to the rear where the uh, barn conversions are taking place. The site itself Ah, just one moment. If we can just pause for a minute, we've got a slide. Are members seeing anything coming up on the screens? I am. I, I must admit I am as well, so I don't quite understand. <laughs> no, but which the, the members who've got it on the screens in front of them, so you are logged into. Just bear with this for two minutes and we'll just get the IT stuff up and running. Just these, so, and again, just to confirm, which members have got problems seeing the, the presentation? So it's Councillor Pierce, Councillor Grimes, and Councillor Perry. With the name. It's caught up. Go. Absolutely, your aura is the effect. So. <laughs> yeah. That changes it for Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Evans, do you want to carry okay. on then, please? Uh, so, the application site is located uh, to the south of the River Axe um, and on a raised bank area to the north of the collection of buildings here. There's no dedicated vehicle access to the site, but the proposal is linked uh, via a walking area here, but we'll, we'll, we'll see that in a bit. So. As I said, there's, there's the primary farmhouse, which uh, was the original dwelling here. We have a number of barn conversions and replacement dwellings located in these areas here. Um, the applicant's property is located here with the proposed glamping area located to the north here. So the proposal is for three teepees located on top of the bank with three associated small ancillary structures containing kitchen and shower facilities located on, on land further, on, on lower ground further to the south here. The application site would also be supported by a parking area here 
where it's expected that visitors would drop their cars and then walk to the site where the accommodation and the facilities would be situated here. This is a layout of the site. So we have three TPs located on timber bases on top of the bank there with the three small ancillary structures located adjacent to them. There'll be a sewage treatment plant located here with a bin store located here. In an amendment to the uh, plans that were submitted at the initial stage of this application, uh, the update is that the, there will be solar panels attached to the roofs of the ancillary structures uh, here on the south facing roof slopes. These are the drawings of the proposed teepees located to the top of the page there. Um, this will be the shower and kitchen facility building here. So as you can see, there'll be a mono pitch design with solar panels located on part of the roof there. This will be uh, the bin store, which will be used by the visitors. And these will all be located within that small area located to the riverbank. Uh, in terms of updates to the report, um, we also have a late comment come in from uh, on behalf of a, a resident um, who has raised concerns over the uh, proposed recommendation in respect of a submission that was made last year for a holiday accommodation not far from this site. Um, they've raised issues over the assessment of the proposal in relation to the submission of a business case and the fact that they feel there was no consistency or lack of consistency between the two decisions. Um, however, we can just briefly touch on that in a bit. So the application site, uh, this is the car parking area here, um, which would then lead to the area for where the cops have been planted along the access to the site. This is a view looking south back towards the um, parking area again with the, as you can see in the distance there, you've got some barn conversion works going on um, for various buildings that have all been granted over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, this is a view looking north to, as we head northwards towards the um, site itself. So we have some tree planting on the left hand, uh, sorry, the right hand side here, an existing hedgerow on the left hand side here. And it's expected that visitors would be walking along here to gain access to the accommodation. Again, further north as we travel gradually, uh, further tree planting and the um, setting of the site there. Um, and here we have the site itself. So on the left hand side, you can just make out one of the uh, raised areas for where the teepees would be sited. Um, and there's some various tree planting uh, going on as well. And this is where you will find the proposed teepees. On the left hand side, this is where the ancillary structures would be. Uh, serving each of those TPs for the shower and kitchen uh, facilities and the bin store will be located on this side here uh, butting this hedgerow. Um, again just taking some views of the existing site, um, the river axe on the right hand side there and uh, the location of the TPs there. This is a view looking back towards the southeast, um, back towards where the access would be, the existing hedgerow planting which would screen the development from majority of vantage points from the south area of the site. Um, and again, where the accommodation would be located would be, be in these unmade patches here. This is you looking back towards the uh, River Axe, looking eastwards, um, and a view looking directly south from the location of the teepees towards the area where the bin stores and the ancillary structures would be located. Now, in reference to the assessment of the application, the proposal was submitted with a robust business case uh, which demonstrated that the scheme would be viable um, after recouping its uh, initial investment uh, at after one and two years sorry after the first uh, three years uh, and therefore over a projected 10 year span is considered that the proposal itself would be a viable concern going forward and would contribute positively to local areas uh, tourism accommodation and provide a varied type of accommodation compared to uh, standard caravan and touring caravan sites. The design of the scheme itself is considered to be acceptable with low impact materials being used and the scale of the development is also considered appropriate for its countryside location. <clears throat> uh, the scale of development doesn't raise any issues with regards to highways or parking as all this will be contained within the site and well away from the established highways and uh, this wouldn't give rise to any significant issues in that regard. In terms of residential amenity, uh, the site itself is uh, to the north of the applicant's own property and a significant distance away 
from the neighbouring properties that are lo also located uh, to the south of the site. Um, so there'll be no issues in terms of overlooking or uh, just noise of disturbance in that respect, given the distances involved. In terms of one further update to the application for the uh, on the basis of clarity is recommended that an extra condition be added that stipulates that the TP shall be limited to three only, including the ancillary structures and that this shall be maintained at all times. Uh, this is an in interest of clarity and for the avoidance of doubt as to the extent of any planning permission being granted in that event. So um, in summary, the recommendation is to grant permission for the TPs and the ancillary structures. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I just see we have a, a, a couple of speakers on this one, so we could start with Kevin Bray, if you'd like to come forward. Good afternoon. Just to confirm, you're speaking on behalf of the Parish Council today? Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, it's Brent Parish Council, Kevin Bray. Start whenever you're ready then, please. OK, thank you. Uh, the Parish Council, in reviewing this application, took particular interest in the design access statement and found that there was no mention regarding disabled access or facilities, contrary to the requirements of the Equalities Act 2010, Section 13. In view of this, the Parish Council took legal advice on the impact of the Equalities Act, which encompasses the Disabled Discrimination Act of 2005, and in particular, Section 149 of the 2010 Act, which, quote, says that public sector equality duty, PSED, is to eliminate discrimination and harassment and victimisation, and advance the equality and opportunity of persons who share relevant protected characteristics from persons who do not share that. End of quote. The applicant's proposal precludes any wheelchair or mobility scooter use from the site and precludes access to the TPs themselves. In addition, no facilities have been provided for disabled washing or disabled toilet facilities, all of which contravene the requirements of the Act. In addition, we found numerous other glamping sites throughout the UK with a simple addition of items such as grasscrete, which would allow vehicles or uh, mobility scooters on them, and disabled toilets uh, and a ramp up to a TP platform. Um, we also found that the officer quoted in there that there is no indication of evidence that different groups would have different needs, experiences, issues or priorities in relation to this particular proposal. This statement does not follow the requirements of Section 149 of the Equalities Act and ensuring that the rulings eliminate discrimination and advance equality and furthermore, the planning committee needs to ask itself if PSED has been discharged, as Sedgemore will be well aware from a recent court ruling. It's unacceptable under the Act to state that providing the facilities to comply with the Act would impact on the visual amenity. They would not. Having taken into account uh, the Act and the applicant's proposals, we are of the opinion and as guided by legal advice that the requirements of the Act have not been followed and that if, as a public body, East Brent Parish Council were to support this application, we would be in breach of the Act and liable to action under the Act. We therefore stand by our decision not to support this application. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay. Matthew Ayers, would you like to come forward, please? Good afternoon again. You'll see the time on the clock. Start whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. Um, just to highlight that the uh, proposal is also in flood zone one, so it's in an area least likely to flood. Um, our business will create a local, small scale and unique environmentally friendly ecotourism opportunity. It will be Easter to summer seasonal only and promote countryside walking, bike riding, tourism and enhance the local economy. It will enable access to the countryside, woodland, the levels, towns and beaches, and through providing electric bikes and guest pickup opportunities from local transport hubs, we will reduce carbon emissions and provide a more eco-friendly and sustainable tourism experience. It will fill the gap in an eco-tourism market in the local area. There is no similar TP business within a 12 mile radius of this proposal. 
Our proposal will also not only comply with, but contribute to the Sedgemoor Local Plan and NPPF framework. It will meet strategic policies one to five, and certainly will contribute to your placemaking policies and spatial portraits where we're trying to promote our local villages and towns in the area. It will further support district-wide policies supporting living sustainably, ensuring economic well-being, enjoying and achieving and being healthy. It will create part-time jobs um, and it will implement, as you've seen, an environmentally friendly um, uh, site with an improved waste management system, which I'll come on to in a minute. We have already planted over 3,500 trees, woodland shrubs for the enjoyment of the holiday guests and that will significantly improve the ecology and biodiversity of the site and mitigate any of the tent habitation issues. Our proposal not only links to many of your district priorities, specifically D17 and tourism, creating a new tourist facility for the area, D20, D21, D22, to name a few others. In addressing the parish main issue of disability access, um, there is a 250 metre unmade track, which is not viable to support motability disability, in my opinion. It will be highly and wholly impracticable for a small business such as this to cater for every disabled person in the country. But disabled people and people with protected characteristics are welcome to our site. It is not just about disability and motability, as the council has suggested. There are 1.2 million people in the country that use wheelchairs. However, there are 2 million that are visually impaired, 11 million that have hearing difficulties, and 10 million that are registered with other disabilities. So the site will only be limited to certain elements of society and not all disabilities, as the councillor has referenced. I do not believe that in this case, that a small business has to uh, comply with all PSED recommendations. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Before I come to members for the, the debate, obviously the issue has been raised here of the PSED um, regulations. So I'm going to come to Dawn Lehman to start with our legal representative and then to our councillor, Mr Noon. Ms. OK. Oh, OK. If you're happy to, I'll go with Mr Noon and then we'll go to legal. Can we have a microphone? She, she may want to sort of come back what I intend to say okay um i'll just draw members attention to the last two paragraphs on page 102 of the report and the first one on uh 103 um case officer has identified that there is a potentially a, a psed duty to be considered um th that duty is to consider the impacts or uh and whether or not a particular proposal would un um, unduly discriminate against anyone, any particular group with protected characteristics. I think, as the speaker mentioned, there the applicant is, you know, it's not possible all the time for every group to be um, you know, considered in detail um, in a, in a report because, as he says, so there are many different characteristics. But your duty is to ensure that any approval here doesn't unreasonably discriminate against people with any any group of people with a particular. Uh, protected characteristics. So from that point of view, we've identified that issue. Um, the particular issue that the parish are referring to is a, a lack of disabled access for the TPs. Um, now that's always going to be an issue with any countryside development such as this. So we need to be what is reasonable for the application to protect, to reasonably protect those with prote um, protected characteristics. It could well be that on something like this, there could be a simple condition could be added. Um, because, as the case officer says in the last sentence on page 102, um, you know, things could be added with little visual impact on the amenities of the site. So we could be looking at the surfacing of the footpath between the car park and the camping area. We could be looking at the addition of sort of ramps, which might be temporary structures that are placed there to help an individual visitor or guest. So there are a number of practical things that could be agreed there by condition because they don't think they would materially impact on the scheme. Now that is, I think, my suggestion way forward. I think what I would agree with the parish on is that, you know, I think we're possibly 
the statement that there is little indication or evidence that different groups have or would have different needs, experiences, issues and priorities in relation to this particular proposed development. Proposed development. That's the first sentence on 102. I think that's probably not quite right. There are many different groups who could have different issues. The issue is that we have considered our duty to have not be mindful of those all the various groups and have we come to a reasonable decision that doesn't unreasonably discriminate. Quite a bit there. I suspect the legal officer may want a little comeback on that, um, but that's the way I feel we could proceed whilst if members debated that we would have considered our PSED duties. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Lehman. Um, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I agree that um, there are some ways to mitigate against um, the, the PSED duty by way of the conditions that uh, Mr Noon has just described. But just to um, give an overview of the PSED duty, the PSE, PSED D is so, which is the public sector equality duty is not a duty to achieve a certain outcome or a specific result. It is a duty for the council to have due regard when carrying out its functions to the need to promote equality for persons with the following uh, protected characteristics. I'm not going to read them out. We had them earlier in the um, session. Um, and um, due regard to equality is the degree of regard that is proportionate in the circumstances taking into account the importance of the policy or the decision to achieve the statutory equality goals and the likely extent of its effects on the protected groups. So I think um, we've we fulfilled that duty to have due regard in the way that Adrian Noon has just explained and I don't have anything further to add on this point. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? We'll start with Councillor Scott. Can you wait for the mic? Yes, sorry. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, could the officer remind um, me, actually, the additional um, uh, item that he wished to add, um, limiting this use to just three TPs um, and ancillary buildings. So, in fact, there'd be six buildings on site. Um, or structures. Um, I also note that there's um, a sewage plant envisaged as well. So is that an additional structure? Personally. Mr Evans. So uh, I've just put up the proposed condition. Um, we're obviously looking at the TPs as being the primary uh, accommodation for the visitors to the site. The ancillary structures themselves are each catered to one TP um, each. So, yes, I mean, we're, we're looking at the TPs more so than the other ancillary elements to the building and to, as to the site in terms of the restrictive condition. Um, so, I mean, we could expand on that if, if members wish, um, but I think the, 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 with that condition in the description we have, it's fairly clear what we're approving if we get to that stage. Um, but I, yeah. it, it, it just uh, just to sort of clarify that, because what we're being asked to approve here is the effectively the use of land for the siting of tents, albeit on deck structures. So, but for belt and braces purposes, we're suggesting this additional condition because the the use of land for the siting of tents is unconditioned in terms of the number of tents unless you specify any condition. So I think we only need to say three TPs. We don't need to worry about the ancillary structures because they're development and they will always require planning permission. So that's the control on that. The treatment works, package treatment works, uh, sewage treatment plant, that's a sh one, one, um, one piece of equipment that will serve the three little um, facilities blocks. That would essentially be development in the ground, but we are suggesting a condition which I forget which number it is, probably the last one, um, because that is that will be the only oversight of that, because um, this won't require building control approval. Um, so we need to make sure that is right through the details to be submitted to discharge condition. But that should be no more than a manhole in the ground. That's all that would be visible, I would expect. Um, but we would see that detail. Councillor Scott. Thank you for clarifying that. Just gone off now. Um, yeah, I. I am a little concerned about this because um, it will be viewed from the NOB. Um, it's, you know, an open landscape and these TPs are actually quite prominent on landscapes. So I would be concerned about that. Um, 
They say it's in flood zone one because it's on the bank. Could you confirm that the area around is in flood zone one? Because um, I do know that this river, the river axe does run high um, in flood and it is the catchment river for the whole of the Cheddar Valley area. So if it was just on the banks in flood level one, um, there could be a risk of the um, river breaching. Mr Evans? Uh, the, the local area is made up of a number of different flood zone classifications. So we have flood zones one, two and three, all within uh, the sort of broader area of the site. Um, so it's, unless I had a map showing the exact areas, but the, the, the site itself, the, the, where the accommodation is being located and where the buildings are being located is defined as flood zone one. Um, I think then the flood levels then, or the flood risk zones become a little bit more high risk as you go further south um, towards the road. But in terms of what we're dealing with here, yeah, the, the, there is a variation to the, the, the classification of flood zones in this, this particular area, um, because that was one of the issues we had with um, the uh, site further south, which was uh, brought up by the late response to the uh, application. But no, there, there is a variation to them. But like I say, the, the important thing is the flood zone is the lowest risk flood zone on the, on the application site. Okay. Councillor Bolt. Thank you. Just going on about the um, the three TPs, which you're securing uh, by uh, uh, it's another uh, amendment. Does that uh, is it going to be enforceable that they can't put up their own tents around the TPs? Because the TPs you can see will probably blend in with the um, the area, hopefully. Mm. Um, but obviously, if you get the bright orange, green, um, bright green. And, and pink ones, then that will be a blot on the landscape. Yes, I believe so. The condition that we're imposing would just be restricted to three TPs. Um, it would restrict strict ability to put any other tents there. Um, and I don't believe that's necessarily what the applicant wants to go for anyway, because of the, the, the specific nature of the design and the layout of what they're uh, in, uh, submitting. Uh, I think the space is important, so I don't think that's the intention anyway, but the condition itself would restrict it to just three only. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Joe. Given that this is effectively tents, that's what TP is. It, we're not talking about mobile homes or caravans or anything like that at all. It's just effectively pointed tents. I uh, will, it, I, th I think as I see it, they will blend in in the background with trees and whatever's there and, and not look out of the place at all. The access to it's fine. It doesn't impede on roads. There's no light pollution. It doesn't affect bats or ecology in any way. Uh, at this moment in time, I'm happy with what's there and I am happy to put forward and propose uh, grant permission. Thank you. Councillor Hendrick, can I just confirm in terms of what you're proposing? Obviously, we've had the additional condition that was outlined by Mr Evans. Yes. Yeah. There was obviously discussion also about the the PSED situation and oh, yeah. whether or not we think it's appropriate for yeah. further mit mitigation to be included. So I just think we need to make sure that we've thought, had that debate as to whether it needs to be included absolutely. or not. I thought it had been addressed already, so I just assumed it would just go forward, and, as you say. Well, I, I, I think, unless I'm wrong, what's being suggested is that's a way forward that could be done. It's up for the committee to decide oh, okay. to take that into consideration yeah. and make a decision as to whether that's what they do want to do. But I'll stand corrected by Ms. Debris. I think the, the situation, as I understand it through the debate, is, is through the Equalities Act, we need to give due regard to accessibility. So accessibility by the nature of what's being proposed, where it is and the access to it is going to be limited for people in wheelchairs. So, so that's the situation. Um, that doesn't mean necessarily that we can't support it because that's one of the situations you have to consider alongside all the other material considerations in the application. So the other material considerations would be the visual impact, um, whether it's appropriate in terms of economic development, rural location, um, is it you know, a nice tourism site. So it does not quite serve every single protected characteristic, but there's very few developments that actually do because of the different requirements of different groups. Um, that doesn't mean um, it needs to be amended, but if members wanted it to be amended, I think the suggestion by uh, Mr Noon was there could be provision, for example, um, of a 
concrete um was it grass crete yeah. from the parking area maybe a path to the first unit yeah. and then discussions in terms of access slopes and stuff um which could be relatively easily incorporated by condition if mem members felt it necessary but i think that would be the limit of what would be acceptable mm. but as highlighted by the applicant the site itself is not particularly accessible in terms of the access into the site so is it reasonable to require that type of facility once you're in the site bearing in mind you're then effectively landlocking that person to that area so mm. it's it's whether members feel it's necessary in terms of satisfying um the requirement or whether on balance we accept that it doesn't meet necessarily all the requirements but that's one of the material considerations in the wider balance of the whole application okay i thought that'd be interesting already obviously it hasn't on the balance of probabilities, as has been pointed out already, you cannot cater for everybody. It doesn't work that way. And yes, you have people in wheelchairs or battery cars, whatever the case is, I fully understand and I get all that. And, and you have to make provisions for all those things. What's been put forward to say an ancillary path to, to take, for example, uh, battery cars is, is not a bad idea. It's absolutely not a bad idea at all. But we'll let everybody else discuss that and see what they think about it. But how things stand as they are at this moment in time, I'm actually happy with that. Because as I, I say again, you can't cater for everybody. And it is, after all, only three units. It's not as if there's seven, eight, nine, ten. There's not, there's only three. So anybody who was booking this as a holiday would look at the paperwork, look at the brochure, do their homework and realise that sometimes it's not for them. So it's not for them. But for some people, considering it's only three, given the state it is, the car park, the little lane going up to it, I'm actually happy as it stands. If somebody else wants to impose that condition, absolutely fine. Okay, so so your proposal at the moment is, as as in the report, with the additional condition that was outlined by Mr Evans about the, the limiting it to three. Okay, Councillor Pierce, I think you'd indicated. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Chairman. I, I was going to second the proposal, and I think as it is such a low key, low intensity um, development, I'm happy to second the proposal as it stands. Thank, okay, you. thank you. Any further comment, debate or questions? I'm not seeing any, so we have a recommendation then is to, to grant permission with the additional condition that was outlined by Mr Evans, limiting the number. Um, those in favour of that, please show. Unanimous. Okay, that is clearly carried, so permission is, is granted. If members can turn then to page 115, please. 106. Oh, I skip. I don't know. Oh, it was out. Of, sorry, it's on my speakers list. It was out of in another order. Okay, let's 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 step back. Sorry, page 106. You know, on my list of speakers, it's it's come out in a different order. But anyway, 106 is where we're going. If that's all right, I'm sorry. Sorry to mess you up. Wasn't that why it was changed? It was the keeper in the same. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> so we move to where are we? Another Stowey. And that is Liam. Yeah. I'm I'm sorry. It's my fault from the chair. I will. I apologise. Getting you both jumping up and down. So absolutely. Okay. So we're page 106. We're Nether Stowey. We are with. Mr Evans again, and I will give you a couple of minutes to reinstall it because I know it's just been all changed again, so. Okay. <laughs> Excellent, <laughs> thank you, Lani. Yeah, well, I'll start when you're ready, please. Thank you, Chairman. Okay. This application relates to New Stowey Farm, which is located to the southeast of Nether Stowey. Uh, the site is accessed via a road coming off the A39 here, which also serves the recreation ground uh, play area located to the north. A bit of back, background to this application. Uh, the site itself was granted uh, prior approval for the conversion of the, for the conversion of uh, the agricultural buildings on site to five um, five dwellings. Uh, within that scheme, we uh, dealt with the uh, principles of the Class Q uh, aspects, and it, and it was granted uh, prior approval following uh, the submission of that application. So in terms of the history of the site, there is an extant fallback position um, for the development of five dwellings. So what we have in front of us today is the proposal to demolish um, all but one of the buildings 
uh, that was granted consent for a residential use and erect four detached dwellings in their place. So in terms of the number of dwellings, uh, one of the buildings is currently, I believe, being converted to a dwelling under the Class Q approval. Um, and the remaining buildings that were granted consent, which were sort of uh, located to the northern side of this building, uh, sorry, this site, uh, will be demolished and replaced under this proposal by four independent detached dwellings. So the access would still come in through the uh, existing roadway to the front of New Story Farm. Um, the application has been amended to avoid any impact upon the private uh, public right of way, which is located along the north boundary, uh, with the dwelling set in from the uh, northern side of, of the area that's dedicated to the footpath. So um, in terms of the proposal that we have in front of us today, uh, this uh, this uh, plan is has been reorientated, so north is facing off to the right hand side. Unit one um, was part of the extant permission to convert the, the agricultural buildings. This will be retained on site and, and converted under that approval. Uh, and the remaining buildings as proposed now will be four detached dwellings uh, located around the north and west sides of that unit. So in terms of going through the plans, um, these are there, are there are two distinct designs, uh, two smaller versions and two larger versions. Units two and three are the smaller of the of the uh, dwellings. So this is the proposed floor plan. So you can see three bedrooms at uh, first floor level with an open plan living and kitchen dining area at ground floor level. Uh, these are the proposed elevations. Um, these have undergone uh, amendments during the course of the application. Um, we have sought changes to the design and the scale of the buildings, and uh, we have now uh, sought more appropriate materials in terms of natural stone uh, combined with the timber cladding above um, with the brickwork detailing as well. So um, these are the proposed units two and three. Uh, and this is the layout for the proposed units uh, four and five. Um, so we have four bedrooms, uh, kitchen dining area and a sitting room at ground floor level. Um, and these will um, be again of natural stone with uh, brickwork detailing um, and tiled roofs above. So in terms of design, we have a similar opening to uh, in terms of the rural appearance of a barn. Uh, you have the larger opening on one side that's being replicated there, sort of a typical sort of infill type of design with the openings there. Um, and just for clarity, this is the proposed unit one, um, which is to be uh, completed under the class Q prior approval. Um, this is situated within the site as well. Um, similar sort of approach in terms of the distinct uh, materials, both both the bottom and the top of the uh, side elevations. Um, and this is the proposed or the approved layout for the uh, class Q of prior approvals. So as you can see, there were there were to be a terrace of four properties. Um, and it's considered that the proposal now submitted makes more of the space um, and makes for a more acceptable development going forward. Uh, these are the proposed uh, views from the public right of way. So this barn will be demolished, um, would have been demolished as part of the prior approval. Uh, this uh, on the just outside of the shot here, you can just about make out unit one uh, that's being converted. This building here, here, uh, is the building that was subject to the class Q conversion. So I'll um, just give you an idea of the existing character of the building. This is a view looking south from the public right of way. So as you can see, the, the site itself is within a sort of valley uh, within the local area. So with the existing landscaping around the site is not considered the development would have a significant impact visually on the village of Nether Stowey or indeed any viewpoint uh, outside of the public right of way. Uh, directly adjacent to it. So in terms of the wider context and the landscape, it's not considered development would have a significant uh, visual effect. This is a view of the northern elevation of the barns, which is to come down and be replaced by the dwellings. Um, in terms of the setting of the right of way, it's considered there would also be an improvement uh, with this more spacious layout and the design and choice materials that are being submitted now. Um, this is a view of the new Stowey Farm uh, main farmhouse. So again, as you can see, in terms of the design, uh, there is an element of um, there is an element of uh, reflection in terms of the designs that have been submitted with regards to that property as well. So it all ties in together. Um, the existing access is here, 
which has good visibility in both directions and also visibility onto the A39. Um, so looking back through to the site, you can see the barns on the right hand side that are, are going to be replaced by the proposed dwellings and unit one located here, which is currently under conversion works as we speak. Um, and again, this is a view taken from further back within the road, just a view of the public right of way and the recreation ground on the right hand side. Um, so the sort of wider context of the site is, is, is clear. So if we go back to the layout plan. Um, so each of the properties will be given dedicated parking um, in a turning area. So all the, all, all the um, vehicles will be able to leave the site in forward gear, not creating any issues in terms of reversing onto the highway. Um, there will be no issues of impact on the residential amenity of the existing new story farm. Um, the property closest to it, this property here, um, will not have any living areas or bedroom overlooking or with windows facing onto the property, which is just out of shot on this plan here. Um, overall, it's considered that each of the properties will be uh, quite spaciously laid out and will provide an improvement to the visual appearance of the site overall. Um, while this is a site that would not normally be granted planning consent for or supported for residential use, um, the fallback position of the Class Q conversion is considered a significant material consideration and therefore from a planning perspective we feel that there would be an improvement to the visual appearance of the site um, and would therefore be able to be supported as a exception to the rural policy. So um, the recommendation is to grant consent subject to the conditions uh, at the end of the report. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, and again we have a speaker on this application so Don Arnold would you like to come forward please? Well, you can certainly make your comments during the three minutes if there's anything you want to comment on, but okay. but please, as I say, take a seat and uh, you'll see. No, the I've time. got plenty of time. I'll keep it short. That's Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. No worries. Um, firstly, I really would like to apologise for the errors in the design and access statement, which caused consternation to the parish council, but ultimately did not affect the content. I personally should have checked the submission and I take full responsibility. Um, the merits of the proposed application compared to the existing one are as follows. It is government policy in the national framework to make effective use of a site. The previous layout had four properties in a terrace with inadequate frontage and parking in different areas all over the site. The proposed application allows for more privacy for each property due to the layout using the whole of the site. The properties are not too close or attached, as um, Mr Evans pointed out, with each has, house having access to both their front and rear gardens, which is not the case in the first application. And the parking is within everybody's own curtilage, which makes it safer for children to enter their homes, more convenient for unloading from vehicles. And they'll also have vehicle charging points at each property. We have also included native hedging to be planted by each property to encourage nesting and breeding for birds. And there's also wildfire, wildflower planting for bees and other insects. The existing roof is not suitable for solar panels being aging asbestos fibre cement. Drilling into the roofing material will cause asbestos particles to be released, whereas they can be taken down, that's because they're hooked, and disposed of without disturbing the existing material. The proposed plans have been drawn to allow space for the plant associated with air source heat pumps, which will be in all four properties. Um, the inclusion of solar panels, air source heat pumps and log burners should achieve SAP A standard assessment procedure for energy efficiency. With regard to points raised by the Parish Council, I think Liam pointed out that the development boundary restrictions as it's a fallback from Q was not applicable. They also raised the question of having bungalows. There is one out of five bungalows, um, which is 20%, and the soakaway is only for rainwater because it is actually connected to the main sewer. Um, I hope this application meets with the committee's approval and thank you all for your time. 
just one point to Liam on units four and five. That was the wrong drawing. There was no stone cladding on it. So is it the intention to leave them as being different to the others or have the stone? I'll have to I'll have to call time there, but that may well be a question that we'll we'll take up as well. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So yeah, clearly pointed out the uh, the incorrect uh, drawings were. It, it, we've basically negotiated that stone would be included with the uh, elevation. So clearly, I've, I've put up the wrong plan there. So apologies for that. Um, but no, the um, the the uh, application is to sort of a uniform approach to the design of the scheme. So yeah, that's fine. So if I could just check in terms of the recommendation, will that be referring to a different plan, or is it just literally we've got a different plan on the display? But we can check that during the debate anyway, if you're happy mm -hmm. to. OK. Members, any comments or questions, please? Yeah, Councillor Bolt. Class Q again. Um, <clears throat> I understood that Class Q was to allow conversion of redundant um, farm buildings um, and where possible to be able to build within them, whether it changes the roof materials or not this is actually <laughs> really the class Q here is facilitating a new build in the countryside which uh, our policies are that doesn't happen i realize it's a government issue but with the buildings that are destined to be removed are the heights of the roof going to be the same so that there's no actual change if, if, if you see what i mean um, that's happened on a previous class q it doesn't look particularly um brilliant but it, it it is in keeping or more in keeping with them being farm buildings as we're talking more about the principle do we want to start with mr are you happy mrs to restart on that one to begin with or yeah, so we'll deal with the class q issue First, and then we'll come back to the materials and the and the plan. And also, if you again, it will probably be to Mr. Evans about the the scale of the replacement buildings as opposed to the scale of the one that was with the class Q. Yeah, Mr. Debris. So, in terms of principle, um, the class Q under a prior approval process is basically a form of permitted development that allows you to convert an existing building. So the regulations are quite clear; it has to be an existing building. It has to be capable of conversion, but appeal decisions have been quite flexible in terms of exactly what that means, because under the regulations, you can include new doors, new windows, new new walls, new roofs, anything to enable it to function as, as a dwelling house. But it is still change of use of the building to enable it to function as a dwelling house. As a result of the Class Q permitted development rights, there have been consents granted under the prior approvals that aren't particularly pretty, aren't particularly in keeping, but it is a material consideration. So once they have class Q, if there is um, an indication they will implement the class Q, and in this case they have, they've started building out one of the plots under class Q, um, it is a material fallback position that when they submit then for demolition and rebuild, the fallback is they have consent for four, they're now applying for four, and materially and design, is it an improvement on what they've got consent for? So it's not currently supported in terms of um, countryside location policies or anything like that, but it's the material consideration of the class Q fallback position. And then it's looking at it in terms of design standards um, and impact on neighbours, amenity impacts for the potential future occupiers, which is the full scope of considerations that you don't have as part of the class Q. So the question always with these types of applications is, does it result in a betterment from the class Q consent? So if the answer was no, then we don't have to approve it. If the answer is the class Q was not the best scheme and actually this one's a better scheme, then that's the main considerations for members to have a look at. Um, I think Liam's now got the correct plan up. Um, we have got it listed on the approved plans list. So if when the decision notice did come out, it would refer to the right plan, but I'll just pass back to Liam to just go through the elevations. 
So in terms of the uh, pre uh, sorry, the uh, most recent submitted elevations that were referred to in the report, uh, as you can see, the stone cladding uh, is shown on units four and five, as well as uh, two and three, um, basically just to enhance the rural characteristics of, this, of, of the development itself. So that's the plan that we were looking at. Sorry for the uh, um, the error with the old plan being uh, located on the presentation. In terms of the scale, um, we would see an increase in the height of the buildings by about 1.7 metres over the existing uh, buildings that are on site now. So there would be a material increase in the height of the buildings relative to the existing structures on site. Um, I guess there will be a planning balance as to say would the improvements in terms of the overall design and 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 materials of the buildings that are now being proposed offset that increase in height um i mean from from an officer's perspective i think it would but obviously i'll leave that for members to to debate that that point but um yeah so that's the just for clarity that's the uh, correct uh planning uh elevation there uh for the uh, the larger of the uh, the four dwellings Thank you very much. I've got Councillor Facey. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, um, thankfully the uh, applicant answered some of my questions because I thought this place is looking for solar gain right over. Um, heat pump magic, absolutely superb solar gain. Um, for your information, Chairman, it doesn't show a chimney, but I'm pretty sure that's an insulated um, seasoned timber flue pipe coming out through the top. Thanks. So with all those bits and pieces of it, again, I prefer myself, the eye beholder, I prefer the first drawing, but that's neither here nor there. Um, and I would like to move the recommendation, Chairman, with any additions to grant permission. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Any further comments or questions from members? Councillor Remins. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chair. I'm happy to second. Thank you very much. In which case we have. So we have the recommendation that's to grant permission uh, as as per your papers. Uh, those in favour, please show. One, two, three. Okay, and those against? Okay. And that's that's the full 14. I think Councillor Kingham was up to start with and then went down. Let me just go up. A okay, let's let's take that vote again, please. Those in support of the recommendation, please show. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, that's fine. Exactly. And one against, so that's clearly carried. So, yeah. permission granted. Right, members, if you can turn now to page 115. <laughs> Thank you. And we're moving to Shapwick. And to Ms. Chorley, you'd like to introduce this one, please. So this is an application for the erection of a detached garage and a single storey front extension uh, for a property new lawn in Shapwick. We're not quite getting the display on the screen at the moment. We're seeing the full screen. I've got it. Yep. Thank you. Apologies. Uh, so yes, the erection of a detached garage and single storey extension to a new lawn in uh, a detached dwelling in Chapwick. Okay, so uh, the dwelling house in question is uh, this, this one here that you can see in the centre of your screen. Um, and this is Lawn Lane running along to the south. Uh, we've got a listed building here just to the southeast. A slightly closer view here of the dwelling itself. 
And as I said, this is a listed building. This is an outbuilding that serves that listed building. The application site does straddle the conservation area for Shapwick. So whilst the new dwelling itself is not located within the conservation area, this front amenity space is, and the new garage would therefore be within the conservation area. Uh, so just showing the location plan here. So this is the, the dwelling that we were looking at in the aerial images, and this is the proposed uh, detached garage sitting to the fore. And this is the block plan, which is reorientated. So just to confirm, this is the existing garage here that forms part of the dwelling, so it's integral. And this is where the new garage is proposed to go. Uh, so looking at the existing elevations. And so this is the proposed development. It's an extension to the front of the dwelling here, uh, to the hallway. The existing integral garage will be converted into living space. And this is the new garage that is proposed just to the front of the site. And these are the elevations showing the development as it would be seen. So you can see the work that's necessary to the front of the dwelling in order to facilitate that conversion. And this is the small front extension that they're talking about, which is shown again just here on the on the ground floor plan. Um, and that just creates this kind of front hall space. And this is the garage, so you can see the elevation drawings are just there. It's got a hipped roof. Um, it is sat, as I said, to the fore of the dwelling, so it is um, visible within the street scene clearly. And just some um, street view images um, that I've taken. So the garage would be in this area here, and the small front extension would infill this space. You can see the neighbouring property um, just, just to the side there, to the west. Uh, the dwelling was granted consent in 1993, so it's built with natural stone to finish, um, but uh, and to kind of reflect the, uh, the the kind of local character of the area. But it itself is a, a relatively modern property. Just some other images kind of showing a different angle here to the top of your screen and to the bottom. This is showing the property immediately opposite, which does also have a, a hip roof uh, garage to the front. And just further along the street, so we've got the application site here, and this is the listed building uh, that you can just see kind of slightly further back. And the image below is just again looking kind of further along the street um, uh, uh, where that, that garage would be within the street scene. Uh, concerns have been raised with regards to the impact on um, overshadowing and light. So the agent has provided a sun shading plan to show that the garage at the front wouldn't wouldn't result in any unacceptable loss of light to the dwell the neighbouring dwelling itself. There would be some degree of overshadowing, um, particularly in the winter when the the sun is at its lowest to the front amenity space. But it wouldn't go so far as to affect uh, light within the property itself. So the key issues are the policy um, and the village design statement. The parish council have raised concerns that it uh, doesn't meet with the Shapwick Village design statement. Uh, the statement itself was produced in 1999, adopted um, as an SPD uh, by Sedgemoor. Um, it does make reference to open street scene, use of um, materials, uh, reflecting the character of the area, um, concern over the size of windows. Um, so these are the sorts of issues that, that we need to be looking at when we're assessing the kind of design and impact. Um, my view is that the development, whilst it does sit to the fore of the property, doesn't result in an unacceptable impact on the street scene. It's reflective of the wider character of the area, uh, won't have an unacceptable visual impact. Uh, the amenity impacts of the development wouldn't, wouldn't be unacceptable on any of the neighbours um, or the future occupiers. Uh, the conservation officer has been consulted um, and they have confirmed that they're in support of, of the scheme that's before you today. Um, in terms of the planning history, there was a previously withdrawn scheme for a larger garage that sat further forward and uh, slightly different uh, fenestrations to that front elevation. Our concerns have been taken on board. The applicants withdrew that scheme, um, went away, did a further heritage assessment and have come back with an amended scheme that we feel addresses those concerns sufficiently. Um, in terms of highway safety, there will still be sufficient space for um, parking off-road and we've not got any objections in terms of visibility. 
Um, in terms of ecology, there are no concerns and we can secure uh, biodiversity net gain as part of the application. Um, so for that reason, it's recommended to grant approval subject to conditions. Thank you very much. Again, we have a speaker, uh, Candy Wall, if you'd like to come forward, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my notes are short because the uh, points have been covered very well by the planning officer. Our agent has submitted detailed plans, a heritage statement, and taken on board from the objectors, held discussions with Sedgemoor Planning through, and through planning advice. The outcome is now we feel it should be appropriate and acceptable to all parties. We've moved the location of the garage, reduced it in size and height. And as a result, none of the consultees, which include conservation and heritage, have shown any objections other than the parish council. Well, what I'd like to do is give a rationale behind the need for this application. It's not just we want a new garage. My husband was born in 1952 in a farm situated within the Shatwick estate and has always lived in the area. The existing garage conversion is needed to enable us to stay in our home long term to future proof it. My husband has a long history of complex health issues starting in 1996. In 2013, he was put into an induced coma with encephalitis, which has resulted in acquired brain injury. Since then, he's had many readmittances to hospital due to this brain injury. The result is that he has a hidden disability. And we already heard about accessibility today. And we are wanting to make a, a room that he can call his own. And if needed in the future, to have a downstairs shower room and a bedroom. The consequence of converting the existing garage to this room would be a replacement garage is needed. And therefore we've worked with Sedgemoor Planning to adapt our plans to make it agreeable to them. The first application in uh, 2021 was objected to by the PC. Half of the PC actually resigned after that. And when they came for their next meeting, it was new uh, parish councillors. Most of these were addressed immediately and changes were made after planning advice sought. The application was withdrawn prior to decisions and amended and resubmitted as advised. The current application has also been objected to by the PC following new objections from neighbours, including the shading issue, which we've seen has been addressed. Um, I would just like to comment on one of the neighbours' objections, and that again has been addressed in your agenda, as I've seen. Um, it, I believe it's one of self-interest and not a planning issue, as he que clearly stated in two of the objections. I'm quoting, I would like to add that I'd like to object due to the fact that any new front window on the old garage could prevent me from applying to submit to build a garage when I want to do one. Quickly go over. OK. With regard to the village design statement and the said more planning, I'd like to think both remain flexible enough to meet an individual's needs, which would be supported and encouraged to enable residents to adapt their properties in order to remain in their own homes in a village they've lived for over 70 years and 21 years in Shatwick. If you want, I can provide medical evidence of his brain injury. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well timed. Mm. Members, any comments or questions, please? Yeah, start with Councillor Kingham. Thank you, Jim. Um, I don't have a lot of problem. I know the I know the road and the houses, and uh, I wouldn't have a problem recommending the approval of this application. You'll move the recommendation. Move the rec okay. Councillor Evans, uh, happy to second that resolution. Thank you very much. I mean, certainly from my own point of view, it does look like the applicants have worked closely with their officers to to amend plans that they originally had and have taken everything on board. So. Those in favour of the recommendation, please show. That's okay. unanimously carried. Thank you very much. <laughs> we might be. The clock's going again. Okay. At which point, members, uh, just... Just to stop them talking. Thank you. Just just before we uh, move on to the next application, um, I'm going to allow you to have a, another five-minute comfort break. Uh, teas and coffees have just been delivered as well, if you want to get yourself a drink. Start. So we're moving to page 138. Um, we're in the parish of Weir, and I think Mr. Lloyd, you're presenting us this one, please, and you're joining us online. I am. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Thank you. And can you yes, see me? Can you see the the presentation? We have a picture of yes. Uh, it's not the, it's not the front cover, but we have oh apologies an orchard by the look of it. <laughs> Bear with me a second. How's that? Yep, that's that's great. Super. So Orchardley Farm lies to the east of Stone Allerton and permission is sought for a change of use of the building used for cider making to um, a mixed use um, for a cider brewery tap and for occasional functions along with use of outdoor space uh, for seating and a smoking area and also um, a proposed toilet extension. The description of development has been amended uh, during the course of the application as the use uh, has, has commenced, uh, although not the extensions. Uh, and so the application is now retrospective. I do have one update to report. Um, officers are recommending two further conditions for clarity. So one is uh, that the retail element of the mixed use described in, the, in that description of development um, is uh, the condition limits what is retailed to specifically to those uses effectively to preclude it becoming a, you know a general shop um, and also uh, in relation to the occasional functions sought um, we've agreed with the applicant's agent that that should be limited by condition to a maximum of 28 functions a year uh, so i do i do have the specific wording of those if uh, if members need it but when it comes to the the recommendation uh, the officer's recommendation is subject to those additional two conditions so if if members are um, are proposing the application then that, that that's what to bear in mind please so moving on to an aerial shot um, this just shows the site in context as, as i said it's it's to the east of stone allerton um, if members can see the blue dot, um, this is the, um, the the side of barn at the western end of a pair of, of, of buildings and at the wet, sort of midwestern end of the site. So the proposed access, um, which is an existing access, is at this bend. Uh, so that is a long established access, which is also shared with a public right of way. Um, I'll, I'll explain a little bit further on, but there is a holiday let being granted just to the south of this blue dot, um, and that access was permitted to be used um, as part of um, of that um, that holiday let proposal. So, although the access is pro is proposed to be used as part of this application, it's not a new access. The farm does have um, an existing access um, to the east. Um, although um, visibility um, out onto the main uh, Notting Hill way there is is pretty restricted. And members will have seen from the report uh, that a number of concerns and objections were raised uh, by local residents in relation to um, the access. And some people thought that, um, that this as an alternative access would be preferable as a result of which um, we requested County Highways um, to go and have a look. So they've been on site and confirmed that, that the, the proposed access from the back lane, uh, this access here um, is a safer access. It has better visibility, but I will show members some, some photographs about that in, in due course. So this is just sort of zooming in now. Uh, and as I said, the um, the cider barns located to the midwestern side of the farm. You can see that um, from these um, from these boundary trees it is sort of well screened in public views. It's it's set back by um, behind this field pasture. Uh, members can obviously see all the, um, the all, all of the, the the cider apple trees. Um, what I've done with this side, slide is is, is plot the nearest unrelated building so just to the east is the um is the applicant's own dwelling um to the southeast we've got the nearest dwelling uh, which is circa 140 meters as, as the crow flies um 
the property nearest dwelling to the sort of northeast um, fronting onto Nottingham Way is 155 metres and then to the west uh, towards the Stonalton direction uh, nearest dwellings about 175 metres away. So this is um, the block plan which accompanies the plan and application, um, which shows that uh, the, ac the access on the bend, um, we've got the, the, the side of barn where the side of making happens and, and now used as a brewery tap and, and that's what the retrospective permissionist seeks. And then another um, farm building to the east and then this building to the south uh, is a holiday let, an established holiday let, which has been granted permission previously. So turning now to the block plan, um, we have the cider barn here uh, with a double apex roof. The areas uh, that are shaded lilac are um, the sort of seating and smoking area. The smoking area is, was a requirement of, of the license application, I understand. Um, parking provision, um, which is, um, has been implemented, including a wheelchair accessible parking. And this uh, small area uh, on the western edge is the is the toilet block extension. So um, pedestrians would come in and through in this direction, and anyone driving will come in and round into the parking area. So the principal issues are highways, as I've said, um, but county highways are, are satisfied with that. Um, there's some minor ecology considerations, but the ecologist is satisfied. So it's principally a noise issue. Now, because it's retrospective um, and some events happened which generated some noise complaints, that's given the opportunity for the councils and environmental health officers to get involved, to have detailed discussions with the applicants, noise consultants. Um, as a result of that, a noise report and a noise management plan has been produced. Um, so although it's always regrettable that the application is retrospective, it, it has afforded the opportunity um, for environmental health officers to consider noise issues in detail and to be satisfied with the, um, the, the, the eventual noise management plan. Um, what this does is to seek to ensure that the premises are um, properly managed and as with any such use, um, management is key. Um, it will be partly through the control of um, electronically produced noise inside, uh, so amplified music, uh, and also um, requires some monitoring at the noise boundary. So to be clear, at, at those kind of distances involved, environmental health are saying that they're satisfied that, that, that the use is acceptable with the noise management issues in place. But what they're not saying is that is that noise will be inaudible at all times. So you can you can hear conversation or you may hear snippets of music as and when the door opens and closes. Um, but there are provisions that the windows are kept closed, the doors on a closer, um, the rollers shutter doors which are required for the cider making are kept shut when there's any music in the building. So they're all management issues which, which are controllable. But in terms of the outside seating, you know, some occasional noise will be heard. But for it to constitute a statutory nuisance, my understanding is that it has to be a prolonged period of noise above a certain de decibel level, which is set in the noise management plan for a period of 15 minutes. And I'm advised by environmental health colleagues that the measures in place are um, satisfactory. So I'll move on with the presentation and provide members with some photographs. So uh, this is a, a sort of close up of the access. Um, the photographs were taken some time ago, some time ago. So what can be seen is um, the there's a large sort of forecourt and, 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 and set back off the highway. And one of the requirements of the, high, of the highway conditions is that that area be consolidated so that that type of material that you see in there isn't brought out onto the highway at all. 
members can see from the two photos at the bottom that the visibility is 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 good in both directions and, and much better than from the other access. Uh, so looking round and back into the site again, uh, photos taken in January and May show the slightly different uh, condition of, of, of the access track, which is uh, which has been improved. And members can see the um, the style at the western side of the gate, which is the public right of way, which runs parallel with that access. So a little bit further into the site now, um, this is the the internal roadway into the site, and then the uh, the view of the um, of the side of barn. So the side of barn is this double apex white building. Um, members can see there's a new area of um, of reseeded lawn because the um, the existing grass was 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 rough as you can see. Uh, there is a string of lights that members can see. Um, they're these sort of warm glow uh, LEDs that you know people have of standard in their um, in their own private gardens, and the ecologists are, are satisfied that um, if that's the only source of lighting and, and no other additional lighting, then uh, there's no implications for the ecology, notably for bats. So a, a little bit closer view of the um, of the building in question. So you can see the um, the roller doors, which are required to you know, bring the apples and the, and the, the cider in and out. Um, there's a new pedestrian door inserted here, which will be on, on a self closer. This just shows that there's a slight change in level between the area outside of the, the entrance to the barns and the seating area. Uh, but that's sort of sloped around. The, the, the photograph on the bottom right shows um, how there's a sort of slight slope around and, and up to that without a step. At the moment, there's some portable toilets because, as I said, the use is retrospective, but the proposal includes um, a small uh, addition to the western side for, uh, for um, permanent toilets. And again, another shot of the uh, of the cider barn itself and the smoking area with the um, the access to the holiday let beyond. So this was uh, before the uh, the building was um, had a bit of a facelift, but th this is the side where the um, where the toilet extensions plan. And ten are now inside the barn. Uh, this shows uh, these two shots show the, the the seating area. The camouflage netting is just to disguise the side of making uh, equipment inside. And then these are two of the bar area. And so what happens is um, effectively it's split in two. But when there's a band, uh, that, that the bottom right hand photograph, they sort of use some pallets and uh, the musicians can sit on there and, and, and play their music. Um, for the most part during the day, that area is used as a transition between the side of making uh, and the side of storage areas. Then just a few more uh, shots, internal shots, just to give members a, an idea of the scale and perspective of what's going on inside and some close ups of sort of what's happening beyond the camouflage netting in terms of the side of making. So turning now to the plans, these are the original proposals, uh, sorry, the original elevations um with the revised elevations and the uh, and the small uh, toilet extension that members can see there then this is a, a layout plan showing the premises effectively with the the uh, the, the, the tap room seating on and bar on the left and the side of production on the right with the um with the external toilets And then in summary, um, the use has com uh, commenced, which is, as I said, you know, always regrettable. It has, though, nevertheless afforded the opportunity uh, as a result of that operation and noise complaints arising to address those concerns, principally through the planning conditions um, and through um, the noise management plan. Uh, as I said in the presentation, um, the key to any use is good management, uh, which has been set out how the premises will be managed into the future in that noise management plan, which is a condition of the recommendation. And as I said, that's been prepared in conjunction with um, Search and Moore's environmental health officers. Highways are satisfied that premise, uh, and the premises uh, is already licensed um, 
for the sale of alcohol. What we've tried to do is uh, is link the, the hours of use conditions with the hours of the, the license so that that's cons consistent. So subject to the uh, the conditions as set out and then the two additional conditions, um, as I said at the start, um, tying in the use to the um, to the to the goods specified in the description of development and also limiting the occasional functions to 28 days a year. Officers are recommending approval of the application. That concludes the uh, presentation. Mr Chairman, I'd be more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a number of speakers on this one, so I'm going to come to Gavin Roberts first, who's joining us via Teams. So if you can turn on your microphone, please, Mr Roberts, and just let us know that it's working. Can you uh, hear me, Mr Chairman? Yep, we can. So again, just to remind you, we'll, we've got the clock that will be running here for the three minutes. When you've got one minute of that time left to go, I will sort of briefly interrupt you and just let you know. OK, no problem. Thank you. Now, let's start whenever you're ready then, please. Okay, uh, afternoon all. Uh, my name is Gam Roberts uh, and I live in Stoll Allenton uh, with my family. We moved into the village uh, late October last year. Uh, I'd just like to offer my perspective uh, in support of the application. After being in the village for only a few weeks, being in the army, I deployed for seven months overseas. I found Ad Astra as a focal point within the village and a meeting place was a key element in the support for my wife while I was away. I personally fully support a small family run community focused business like Ad Astra. And it's very often the case they become the heartbeat of their communities. Something has been lacking the prolonged closure and lack of availability of the local pub. These social hubs are crucial for better connected communities, more neighbourliness and all together strengthen society. Something we as a family have personally benefited from. I've met many new friends. My young son has also made many new fond memories with other village children and a quiz run monthly is very popular, all a short walk away from the house. It's also great that local produce is produced and sold within the community. This only strengthens the local economy and unlocks the power of local purchasing. The cumulative effect of money spent at a local business stays in the local economy much longer. The money is more likely to be spent at other businesses in the community, along with the fact they pay local taxes. Most importantly, buying locally helps preserve and create local jobs. I don't have any reservations around the plan application. I know a great number of other villagers and locals feel the same way. As with all applications, there are supporters and objectors, but I hope when a decision regarding this application is reached, the social and economic opportunities are recognised. I hope the committee is able to provide the direction and guidance required to enable this community focused business to prosper. That's all I have to say. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Scott, would you like to come forward? Again, as you know, Councillor Scott, you've got the time on the clock. Start whenever you're ready, please. Uh, yeah. Uh, Chairman, um, I have been contacted by nearby residents who are unable to make representations today because they have a fear of possible repercussions. Whilst it is generally accepted a low impact use selling cider and local produce in this quiet rural area is not a detriment. This application goes further than having a low impact. Unfortunately, it's an open ended facility, a shop, a tap room, private and public functions with live music going on until 11 o'clock in the evening. Educational tours and a tourist destination with no limit on numbers at any one time. Expected visitors on the tap room night, this is in your papers, um, it's between 40 and 60 people. How many cars? 10, 40, but there's only 12 parking spaces. A recent music night, tickets were available on Eventbrite. This could have brought in over 500 people. The site, it's not easy to see on the photograph, is actually surrounded by houses. Um, many people are in support of this application, but they don't actually live within a close proximity. So <clears throat> some of the gardens go down nearer to the property and the closest one would be about 120 metres away. And some, yeah, they're about 120 metres. 
Residents have enjoyed peaceful residential amenity in this area. Unfortunately, it's been destroyed by recent events which have been taken um, illegally here. Although the NP MP sets out the standard, but unfortunately it does not go far enough and to allay residents' concerns. The access roads are totally unsuitable for large numbers of cars leaving this venue late at night. They're both single tack, unclassified roads, no pavements or lighting, and pose safety concerns for local residents. The, fo the footpath runs through the property near the seating outside the drinking area, along the driveway and across the road on the bend. This footpath is often used by local children, dog walkers. An increase in the number of cars will be hazardous. I would suggest a site visit to enable you to appreciate the complete the whole area. If you're not minded to have a site visit, I would wonder if you would consider extra conditions. Limiting the number of people at any one time at this facility, acoustic, acoustic fencing around the outside drinking and parking area, a reinstatement and improvement of hedges near residential properties to reduce. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Scott. Thank you. As you see, we have one further speaker, which is uh, Stephen Rolfe. Mr. Rolfe, could you enable your microphone, please, and just let us know that it's working? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So again, um, you've got three minutes. Uh, I will let you know when you've got one minute of that time left to go. So please start when you're ready. Thank you very much. My wife and I own Orchard Lee Farm, moving here in 2020. At the time, the previous owner sold all the apples to Thatchers and relied on income from a mobile bar business, which was run from one of the agricultural barns. He obtained planning permission to demolish the agricultural barn to build three holiday lets. This planning permission remains extant. My wife and I decided not to demolish the barn, but to renovate it instead due to its significant historical past and restore the local activity of cider making, which had been lost for over 25 years from this established 13 acre, 2100 tree cider orchard. In the first year, we pressed just 10 tons of apples with the help of many from the local community. This enabled us to generate over 6,000 litres of cider valued at around £48,000. This is in contrast to selling 55 tonnes of apples to Thatchers for only £3,800. We have worked hard with the local community to ensure we consider and address every concern. In fact, several local people who submitted letters of objection are now regular customers, but they have seen no increase in traffic or noise. We are aware we cannot please everyone all of the time, but as can be seen from the substantial number of letters of local support, we are being applauded for our efforts. It has always been our drive to be a meaningful and trusted community asset. We are a veteran owned business who are proactive in helping our community. Since opening our doors on the 26th of March, we have raised over 750 pounds to help the heroes. We have sponsored the local reach opportunity center for young adults with learning difficulties in their fundraising activities. We have committed to sponsoring our village cricket team for the next two years. We have supported a local Ukraine appeal event, a local fire station event, and a local Weir Parent Teachers Association event by providing prizes for their fundraising efforts. We have employed local people when needed and only used local tradesmen when required. We grow traditional Somerset apples, harvest, press, ferment, and sell on site. We allow a local farmer. You have one minute to go. Thank you. We allow a local farmer to keep sheep in the orchard at no charge to reduce the need to use grass cutting machinery for environmental and noise reduction purposes. In our first year, we have been awarded several awards, including one gold, silver and bronze awards at the British Cider Championships for our cider. In addition to working closely with the local community, we've worked hard with Sedgemoor licensing and planning to develop the most robust set of conditions and noise management plans to address every concern raised during the consultation period. And we will strictly adhere to these. We hope that the development committee are convinced that we are socially and environmentally responsible company that will only provide a positive impact to the community in line with the Sedgemoor local plan and the national planning policy framework. The acceptance of this planning application along with the conditions will ensure our economic and environmental sustainability that would be impossible without. That's me complete. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr Lloyd, is there anything you wanted to respond to in terms of the comments that were made by the speakers before I come to members for questions? No, no, thank you, Chairman. Okay. 
Members, any comments or questions, please? Yeah, we'll start with Councillor Bolt. Just a bit of clarification. On, pla on planning, are we able to put on a restriction of 28 days? That's licensing, isn't it? Uh, who was? I, I, I can take that, Mr Chairman. Or Mr Lloyd? I, I, I can take that, Mr Chairman. Oh, Adrian, are you going to do? Apologies. Um, Ian, can you just confirm whether the restriction of 28 days was one of the additional conditions? Yes. Oops. Yeah, yeah, yes, the, the, it was an additional condition because it's not actually um, a condition of the licence. So um, under the licence, just coming back to a point of clarification raised by one of the speakers or a request by one of the speakers in terms of limiting the number of people attending the venue. Um, on the bottom of the licence, there's a bit saying that there will be a limit on the number, but that's to be established um, through a fire inspection as a result of the licence. So the number will be capped, but not by us. It doesn't fall under our requirements. We can't limit it that way. Um, in terms of the days, it was 28 days um, for events because under the um, temporary use of land, um, general permitted development rights, you can undertake a temporary event for 28 days anyway. So imposing something like that on this type of use is, you know, it's inside a building, so it's the use of a building, so it doesn't comply with the um, permitted development regs, but it's, it's akin to what they could do anyway through PD, so it was considered to be reasonable. Yeah, I wasn't um, querying it in that respect. It was whether we have the right to do it or whether that should come through licensing, because then they've got the control over enforcement. Yeah. Whereas uh, we, we've had this before and we don't have that control necessarily. We we would like it to be controlled by licensing, but we've checked the license and the license hasn't strictly restricted it. So actually, given the concerns and the immunity issues that are raised with third parties, we did consider it reasonable to impose the condition. And we can enforce it? Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, I've got Councillor Kingham, Councillor Grimes. Obviously, there's a, a number of people that have put uh, their various complaints in regarding this, uh, this um, venue. But there uh, any complaint being put in regarding the noise? Because obviously they have live music there occasionally. Uh, it's not obviously a building made for uh, music because it's an agricultural building. Yeah, if I may, because I was behind the su suggested condition of 28 events, functions per year, because at the moment the, the, the description of development is suggesting occasional functions now that's not good enough it should we ever find ourselves in an enforcement position because there are too many events so 28 day 28 events a year would come would mirror what you can do under permitted development light on land it's in a building so it's subject to this permission so we need to define that now it's going to be open we're not defining the days when it can open only the hours we need to i think just be a bit precise on functions so that we can distinguish between when it's just open and people enjoying themselves as opposed to a, a function so i would certainly suggest live music events which should be regarded as functions pre-booked parties i would suggest need to be regarded as functions and i think we could clarify that by an informative that would say that functions referred to by condition number whatever shall include the following events just to give everyone clarity but not you know they'll be open as many days a week within their hours as they want to, as they they would be but when i think we just need to be the one-off party type events we need to define what they are and limit them by number and that's the intent of that additional condition yeah it's just uh, as to whose remit we were under whether we we're under planning or licensing it's a planning control licensing they would still need licensing for any special yeah. Yeah, music events and whatnot, but that would fall outside of our control. And they, right. I think it's just a belt and braces approach in view of the comments that have been received locally. And my understanding is the applicant is, is, is happy with the limited to 28 fun functions. Uh, and I think in addition to the 28 is to specify. Yeah, well, I functions. think that's we need to define that as well as limit it. OK. Um... Could I just ask, Mr. Lloyd? I think there was a question was asked relating to were we aware of of complaints in terms of noise? 
Yes, yes, Mr. Chairman, we were. So the, 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 there's been a number of events and, and, a, and a number of, 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 of noise complaints in, in relation to those events, as a result of which, um, you know, we got environmental health colleagues involved. Okay. Councillor Kingham, did you want to come back further on that? Are you? I don't know whether we're able to put conditions on that they should be the same. Obviously, it's an agricultural building. It's not made for loud music. So there's no way we put condition on it. Whether you have to accept what it is. Uh, and so, again, I'll just just, just so, check: are we straying into to, to licensing conditions here rather than planning conditions, Mr. Lloyd? No, I'd say I'd, I'd say it's 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 a material planning consideration because because it, you know that it's the noise that's created inside the building, which could you know principally affect the the immunity of of people living border in the site. So um, we did look at, at, at the possibility of that with um, with the applicants and with environmental health. But environment health officers view is is that it's it's the level of noise inside the building and, and what level of noise that generates outside of the building, which which creates the issue. So um, you could insulate the building, but if you play the noise three times louder, then you, you know it'll be louder outside than than if you than if you hadn't insulated it. So it's about controlling the noise output, um, which is what the management um, plan seeks to do, and and that 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 limits that to to what is audible at the at the nearest boundary to a specified db level so you know during an event um there's a, there's a requirement for the applicants to monitor that noise level um at the boundary at some point during the evening now obviously if there's complaints during that event then that, that that's the time that 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 action would be taken but the noise management plan talks about you know the responsibilities of of you know of the musicians of the um of the of the owners about making sure that levels are not so loud that it would you know in any way breach that um that that noise level at the boundary so again to be clear that's not that everything would be inaudible at the boundary but you know the, there would be occasion when you would hear some noise but what you wouldn't be able to do is to be able to discern you know the difference between you know one track and another you know so one artist and another for example and, and not for any kind of prolonged period of, of time and again you know if someone's out in the garden they've got a child the child shouts you know you'll hear it um and it, and it might be louder than 50 db but it, it wouldn't be for 15 minutes and it wouldn't breach the condition so that's that's basically the 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 approach taken by um, by environmental health and and agreed with the, with the applicants noise consultants because there's there's no um, there's no universal standard for for noise for for, for this type of um, for this type of of use. Okay, okay. I mean, you say committing it to finishing at a certain time, obviously, then would comes under a different head and it's under licensing, so so restricted amount of time. Yeah. And and so again, what, what, what we've done is we've 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 got planning conditions on the hours of use which which are linked to those same hours of use permitted use with the through the licensing. So it's effectively eleven till eleven. Okay, I've got Councillor Grimes up next. Can someone pass the mic? Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, it is a, a bit of a difficult one. There is a lot of these businesses with cider farms and barns and whatever. I personally don't have too much of a problem um, providing that we've got the conditions in place, which we seem to have with licensing and if this was passed. So taking it overall, I don't have too much of an issue with this. Thank you. Okay, that's the end. You're not wanting to say anything more? I will wait to see if there's any more comments. Okay, fair enough. Councillor Evans. We'll come back to it. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I'm always tempting to go with a with a site visit to a side of bond, but I think mm -hmm. that's maybe not something. I can't see what would be gained from doing that apart from apart from a good evening. Um, I, I can't, Councillor Scott did suggest that an acoustic fence might be um, a beneficial. Um, is that a reasonable condition and something we could add in? 
it, it is it is something that, um, that that was discussed with environmental health health officers, um, Councillor Evans. But um, effectively, what they're saying is the what you'd need to do is put the acoustic fence right next to the building. It's not it's, it wouldn't be an acoustic fence next to the boundary, which would be ineffective. Um, and so, you know, they, they they just they considered it, but but discounted it as a, as as an effective measure. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, on that basis, I will move through it off as a recommendation. Okay, and just to confirm that's with the additional conditions and the informative that was added. It certainly is. Thank you. Is that seconded? Councillor Grimes, thank you. In, uh, in that case, uh, with the conditions as we've got in place, I'm happy to second that. Thank you, Chairman. And the informative. Yes. Thank you. I just want to make sure. It, yes, so just to confirm that's delegated because we're yeah, tweaking it. Really okay, wooden. thank you. If there's no further comments from members, we've got a delegated permission with additional conditions and an informative. All those in favour of that, please show. That looks to me to be unanimous. Okay. And I would say there's nothing stopping members doing a site visit of their own after the event if they wish to. <laughs> We have done coach tools in the past, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Members, we have another application which is over the page uh, and takes you back to page 125. And Shipham and, oh, as if by magic, Mr. Titchener is back with us. And we have Councillor Scott back in the room, so that's fine. OK. Excellent. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. OK, thank you, Chairman. Uh, so uh, this is an application at Elm Close in uh, Shippham. Uh, it's a proposal for the conversion of the loft to living accommodation, the installation of the dormer window and Juliet balcony to the rear elevation and the installation of solar panels to the uh, front at north elevation. Uh, so uh, this is just showing the site. It's actually not in the main uh, built-up part of Shipham. It's over on sort of a peripheral part, which is closer to the A38. So you can see there's this small cul-de-sac of bungalows here. It's this uh, relatively central bungalow uh, within that group. Uh, the site is within the Mendip Hills area of outstanding natural beauty. Uh, so this is just a site plan. Uh, as I indicated, there's a number of bungalows all in this row. The works are primarily dormer windows are on the rear facing elevations so are not visible from the, um, uh, the the public highway to the front and then the solar panels to go on the roof. Uh, so this is plans of the existing building. So it's a fairly sort of uh, typical uh, bungalow uh, construction with appearance, uh, rendered walls, tiled roofs, etc. Uh, with some stonework on the gable to the front. Uh, the existing sort of floor plans show it's primarily uh, accommodation at ground floor, and then there is already existing access into the loft, but it's not necessarily uh, currently converted into any uh, usable living space. The proposal would just see on the front elevation some solar panels uh, indicated showing here, and then at the rear there is just these two dormers over predominantly on the one side uh, of the unit, and uh, this one here with the uh, Juliet balcony as shown, and some of which has been uh, subject to concern raised by the parish council. Mm. Uh, and just internally, you see. Uh, I mean, yes, those dormers are sort of pushed over more to one side. I think that reflects where the actual usable convertible space is within the loft in this one. Uh, so it does give it a slightly um, uh, sort of unbalanced but the, uh, um, use, but that's where the existing upstairs space is to be made use of. So this is this is a photograph just taking of the rear, so standing within within the garden of the property. So those those dormers would be on the roof uh, structure here. Um, they, it is a rear-facing roof structure, so there will be um, no visual impact in terms of uh, when viewed from the street scene to the front. Um, it is a wide-fronted dwelling, um, so uh, whilst we'll take on board the comments of, of the parish council, um, views that these properties have fairly wide rear gardens and views are from these type of ones, uh, windows generally projected over the applicant's own garden. Um, the Juliet balcony is, is, is the more um, 
is the one that would give rise to more perception of overlooking because it is a Juliet backing, but that's the one that's centrally located within the rear roof slope. So we wouldn't consider there to be significant overlooking of the adjoining gardens that would arise. Neither should it be noted have any objections been received from any neighbour uh, as part on the application. Um, and then just some photographs just to show the adjoining relationship with the property. So you can see um, you can see the general width. Still, the properties are fairly wide um, uh, along there uh, within their own plots. And again, the relationship here, um, there's a slight sort of offset, a slight angle as the properties are angled away from away from each other. They're not all directly in a straight line. And then here, this is just sort of stood on sort of the terracing at the back, um, you know, so views. Views would have to be at a very acute angle to look over the neighbouring property to what would be on the left hand side of this picture and would be very peripheral of only of the most lower parts of the garden and not something that would give rise to um, uh, uh, an objection from officers. And then just looking in the other direction again peripheral views looking in that direction over over to the right but again not direct views not of any of the most sensitive areas of that garden and actually largely screened by a lot of uh, existing uh, vegetation and panelling here such that we would not consider there to be unacceptable amenity impacts on the uh, residential amenity of those occupants so overall the issues we would say is we would not consider it to have a Vis unacceptable visual impact on the character of the area. We wouldn't consider there to be unacceptable loss of privacy to arise. Um, the county colleges had requested a bat survey and that did delay the application for, for some time, but no bats were found and a, a bat and bird box enhancement condition is proposed to be added to the um, permission if granted by way of biodiversity enhancement. Uh, so overall our recommendation is to grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just ask before we come to members? I'm I'm just struggling a bit looking at the site plan with my orientation. Could you just go back to that and explain exactly where this is sitting on the building? So this is the bungalow here. That's its rear elevation there. That's its front elevation there. The dormers are going on the rear. So th this road here is actually the A38, but it's actually quite sunken down below the actual um, the property of the back, which is why it's not visible when you look in the rear garden. Thank folks, you, I've lost the A38 somewhere and I couldn't work out where it's so, okay. So all, all the development is effectively contained within the rear garden, apart from those three solar panels, which are shown on the front elevation. That's the only part you will see from Elm Close itself. Uh, I hope that clears it clears that up it does. thank you thank you very much councillor facey all right <laughs> i thought you were waving sorry anyone wish to ask a question or comment or councillor evans thank you um am i correct in interpreting that the only objection to this is it's a Juliet balcony and there may be some overlooking of neighbouring properties that we've managed to establish there isn't. Yeah, so yeah, the, the, the parish council's objections are on amenity, but none of the neighbours are objecting themselves. Can I move the officer recommendation, please? Thank you very much. Councillor Betty. I happily second that recommendation. Thank you. Okay. If there's no further comments from members, we have a recommendation to grant permission. Those in support, please show. Unanimous. That's clearly carried, so that's, that's granted unanimously. And members, that brings us to the end of today's agenda. So thank you very much. And thank you also for bearing with us through the IET issues that we have had and one or two others. So thank you very much. Meeting closed. <laughs>